dream is about two stars We'll talk about cold or whatever we'll talk about today It's about two stars, so please hang tight while I check that everything is okay Sound, check, camera, check, lights, check How's my hair? Oh, wait, I don't have any hair Maybe put some pants on and I am good to go So get ready wherever you are Cause this stream is about to start Get ready wherever you are Cause this stream is about to start Hi, my name is Lenny Facchinetti, and let's write some code together, shall we? What we have on the menu today is filters. That's a left turn, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> but we are going to talk about decramped filters in equalizers. That's the topic of today. And before I get started, let me say hello to people on the chat. So he hello to Nathan, Justin, and Mike, and Mage. Thanks for joining me today. So before we get into the whole conversation we are going to have, I want to disclose a few things. The reason why we are looking into this topic of decramped equalizers is because of a polemic between Dan Warrell and the Harrison consults. And the disclosure is part one. I got into this conversation because I watched Dan Warrow's videos. And I did not watch Harrison Consoles, never used the product by them, but I have watched many of Dan Warrow's videos. I have not bought any of the plugins that he reviews. I have no affiliation to him, never met the person. He seems like a nice person, but I never met. Everyone involved in the conversation seemed to be nice people, never met any of them. I have no role except for being interested in the topic. And take, take that as you will. Perhaps I will be biased towards one side or another, maybe. You decide. Disclosure part number two is that I contacted everyone involved in the conversation and I invited them to either join the stream. There is actually an on ongoing Skype call that everyone involved in the conversation, here is this Skype call, it becomes this thing, <laughs> because I am on the Skype call sending the same video as I'm sending on YouTube, so we got this kind of effect. But anyway, uh, what I'm saying is, I invited everyone involved from Dan Warrow to Harry Con Har Harrison Consoles, and uh, even the developer of the decramped filter that I'm going to implement today, I invited everyone involved in case they wanted to have a saying. And I also said that, of course, I, it was kind of last minute. I had to invite them yesterday because I only had that idea yesterday. And maybe people are busy, they don't have the time to join the call. I am going to read whatever they sent me via email, via messages here on the YouTube chat, making sure that everyone involved has their voice heard. And that is the disclosure. Everyone involved will get their say. More people on the chat. Hello, Dr. McFarland, McFarland Studios and Bo. How are you all doing this uh, evening for me at least? Maybe afternoon for you. So, for people who don't know where, how, how we got here, <laughs> Here is a brief recap. Um, it all started with this video from a couple months ago, one year ago, something like that. I wish it showed when the video was published, but it doesn't. That's weird, isn't it? 
Well, there are comments from one year ago, so it stands to reason that it's at least one year ago that Dan Waro in his YouTube channel reviewed the Harrison Teresu C channel strip. And one of the things that he found was that the filters in this plugin cramp near the Nyquist frequency. We are going to explain why that works and how that works in a moment, and if you don't know what cramping even means, I will go over that. But anyway, uh, then found this, and because of the marketing materials from Harrison and whatnot, that sounded a bit sketchy, so it was a criticism from his part. Then, in the comments on this video, Harrison Consoles answered, and then there is this second video by Dan Warrow as a, re a response to that response. <laughs> and it has to do with like uh, the expectations about saturation and other parts of the Harrison 32C plugin that I'm not going to discuss today, at least. And then third, there is this video by uh, Dan from Lonely Rocker in which people from Harrison were invited. So, yeah, this is Dan, this is people at Harrison. And they talk about this whole controversy and go into various topics, but one stood out to me as I was watching the video. They said that they knew that the filters in that plugin would cramp near Nyquist, and that they decided to keep it that way for performance reasons, because that's the kind of plugin you are supposed to put on every track in your mixing session, so or tracking session. Anyway, you are supposed to use lots of instances of this plugin. So if, if it performs poorly, it's a problem. And decramped filters would be more CPU intensive. So they decided to go with cramped filters. And that's what uh, started this thought in my head, hey, I know how to do cramped filters and decramped filters, but I never tested the performance of them. I never put them side by side to see which was fastest. And th that's why we are here. <laughs> that's how we got here. And again, perhaps as a matter of full disclosure, I should point out that this whole conversation here, this whole video, this one that we are looking at right now, it left a bad taste in my mouth, and this may bias my opinion, but uh, then from Lonely Rocker had some arguments that I don't agree with. Like, for instance, if Dan Waro wants to say something about some plugging, he has to show his face online. I think that's just not necessary at all. <laughs> As long as you are showing the facts, for instance, one thing that Dan Warrow kept bringing up is that the marketing material by Harrison says that every resistor, capacitor, and transistor is included in the model, and he kept bringing that up. That's a fact. It's here on the website, so no discussion about that. And as long as you are showing facts, you don't have to show your face if you don't want to. It would be ridiculous to ask every scientist to put their little face next to every paper they write. It's just ridiculous to say something like that, in my opinion. So, to be honest, I couldn't even watch this one to the end because the cringe factor was so bad for me. I bailed out in the middle, but the discussion about decramping is somewhere over here, or definitely before the middle which is when I stopped because the cringe was so hard. Anyway, maybe biased, whatever. People have their biases, it's an inevitable. And uh, again, sake of, for the sake of full disclosure, right after I watched half of this video, I was like, mm, this left a bad, bad taste in my mouth. And I commented on Dan Warrow's channel. Again, I watched Dan Warrow. I commented on his channel on this post this is what I commented, you can see here on my screen. So, it is true, I watched a couple minutes of this, about half of the video. I did feel dirty because of all this bickering about showing your face or whatnot. And I did go 
rewatch some of the old videos by Denuaro, including, of course, this video to know what I was going to talk about. And it was when I watching this video, when I was watching the video that I thought about talking about all of this in this stream. And I understand that my attitude may offend some people. I'm not sure how to read the response from, my, from Mark. Maybe it is like mad respect to you for saying that, but I don't think that's how it reads. I think it reads like, hey, Leandro, you should be more respectful. And if people feel disrespected, I'm sorry. It really is what happened. I'm talking about things that happened to me. I watched this. I felt dirty. I did go rewatch some old videos. So I'm not pointing any character flaw in anyone. Anyway, I, I, I needed to say this before we even get into the technical stuff. So, um, I guess I will go back to the chat, but I will also check my notes because usually I don't prepare notes extensively, but since I was going to do this touchy subject, decided to take notes, decided to do everything very properly and try to do the setup as scientific and, and unbiased as I could. And truth be told, what we are going to explore, this performance issue, it doesn't matter how it goes. It doesn't matter what results we get. We are either going to find out that decramped filters are not as computationally expensive, so Harrison's claims aren't really warranted, or we are going to find out that decramped filters are much more expensive CPU-wise. And no matter the result, what Harrison is selling doesn't really match what they say on the website, so whatever the result may be, you could argue that their marketing is misleading anyhow. Now, about whether you should expect saturation, whether their Harrison consoles would be clean, all the rest of the conversation, it's not the topic of today. And all right, so let's go to the chat and see what you all have to say. Nice little Diddy playing right now. Yeah, uh, it's my intro music. Thanks. Um, Nathan from Harrison as well. Oh, okay. So same person on the Harrison Consoles account and the Dr. McFarland Studios account. Um, and I am not sure if you are the person featured in this video. Not sure. Maybe you are one of these two people. I'm not sure. Um, and again, if you want to join the call, I did send an email to as many email addresses as I could find at Harrison Consoles. If I didn't get to you specifically, let me know. I will send you an email with an invitation to join the call. You can join us right now. But anyway, my response was to another user and then Warrell decided to respond to my comment, acting like it was an official Harrison response, which wasn't fair. I think he's saying he respects you. That's a common phrase. Yeah, I, I think that that comment over here could be read either way. <laughs> anyway. Okay, you are the person on the left of the video, so you are uh, this person. Right. Uh, thanks for joining the conversation. Alrighty. And before we get, I guess, another thing to talk about before we get to the tests and to the coding, we are going to do some live coding today. There is the issue of if the filters that are cramped and the filters that are not cramped perform the same CPU-wise. Does it matter? <laughs> Should Harrison have put decramped filters on their plugins? Can you hear a difference? Because it all boils down to that, right? I agree with what people said on the Harrison video, on the, the response video by them. I agree with them that it does not matter if you don't hear a difference. It does not matter if a plugin doctor graph shows some curve that looks correct or incorrect. If it sounds good, it is good. So all of this is of academic interest. It is a fun technical conversation to have. We will get into some mathematics and that will be fun. But can you hear a difference? 
That's a question that I cannot answer for you. Um, in fact, there is another video by Dan Warrow in which he has some listening tests. The don't cramp my EQ style video. But I encourage you to not watch that video and instead test for yourself. First, because YouTube does have a low pass filter on all the content on the platform. And the difference is mostly pronounced on the high frequencies near Nyquist. So the low pass filter on YouTube will mess with any analysis you try to make by watching a YouTube video. Instead, you should take some of your material, some plugins that have EQ curves that cramp and some that don't cramp. I'm going to show you some examples today. And then put that in your monitor, in your room. And then you will be able to test if your ears can pick up a difference. I cannot. I can already tell you that. I already did this test. I cannot tell the difference. As long as you adjust the cue to make up for the difference, the cramped and decramped EQs sound just as good to me. It does not matter. The sound is just as good. <laughs> but it does measure differently. And the mathematics behind all this is interesting. So I thought it would be fun to talk about it anyway. But yeah, mixing is not about graphs on Plugin Doctor. Mix is, mixing is about what you hear. So there is that. This whole conversation could be a moot point if you are only interested in the sonic results that you will get. Do with that whatever you want. All right. And uh, another thing I should mention is that <laughs> Mage is pointing out on the chat that his ears already have a built in low pass. Perhaps that's why I couldn't hear a difference too. <laughs> Who knows? Fun stuff. Yeah. So. Another thing I want to mention is that I am not the first person who, to look into this question. In fact, I have been on some conversations with the designers of the filters, the decramped filters that I'm going to implement today. And he pointed out the same thing, that there are decramped filters in the Fab Filter plugins, for instance. And the Fab Filter plugins are very low CPU compared to other plugins. It's pretty efficient. The Pro Q, uh, Pro Q3 is pretty efficient. And another thing to, to mention in the more technical aspect of things is that for the most part, for most digital filters, you have to do some extra work in terms of CPU cycles when you change the parameters of a filter. So if you change the frequency, the, the cutoff frequency, if you change the gain, if you change the Q, then you have to recompute some numbers, the so-called coefficients of the filter. But to actually apply the filter, for the most part, for most digital filter designs, it does not matter if the curve is cramped or decramped, because in the end you get these coefficients and to apply the coefficients to actually process the audio is this exactly, literally the same computation. It's literally the same lines of code, literally the same instructions in the processor. So the performance difference must lie, at least for this type of filter design that I'm going to cover today, the, field, the difference in performance must lie in the computation of the coefficients. So what this means is that in our tests, when we are going to test the performance, we are going to test correctness and performance of the filters we are going to look into. But when we are getting into the performance tests, we will need to automate some parameters. For instance, we can put an LFO on the cutoff frequency so we force the plugin to recompute the coefficients and then you may be able to see a difference. So perhaps that's another nail in the coffin of that argument uh, on the Harrison console video, because for the most part, you are not putting LFOs in the parameters of something that tries to emulate a mixing desk. You, you do some automation but you're not automating at all times. So you would not be forcing the plugin to recompute the coefficients at all times. 
And in that case, the CPU argument really holds no water because you are not changing the coefficients. I hope that's clear. If, it, if my explanation isn't clear and if there is something that I'm missing, please point out in the chat. All right, so next topic. Now let's get into the technical and mathematical and uh, nerdy-er, nerdy-er bits. Still very nerdy. So why do filters cramp in the first place? And what is cramping at all, actually? Let's explain what cramping is and show what cramping looks like. I'm going to bring up a filter that cramps near Nyquist. So here's re-EQ. I put a band on the, the equalizer and as I bring it up in the frequency spectrum, it starts to deform out of shape. Here it is very symmetrical and it's kind of large. And here it gets asymmetrical. This part has a, a slope and this slope is steeper. It's asymmetrical. Also, it started to thin out as it goes to the upper frequencies. That's what cramping looks like. And why does this happen in some digital filters in the first place? I am not a filter designer. I'm an enthusiast. <laughs> I'm a programmer. I know one thing or two about things, but I don't know the deep mathematical explanations. But here's the best explanation I could make up. Most digital filters are derivations from analog filters. Most digital filters are adaptations of analog filters. People know analog filters very well. People have been studying analog filters for the longest time. So when I say analog filters, I mean literally analog electronics. I mean resistors, capacitors, transistors, op-amps, and so on. So people know analog filters very well. They know how they behave, they know what to do with them, they know what they're good for and bad for, they know the trade-offs in the different kinds of filters you could design. When digital technology came along, the natural thing to do was to translate these analog filters into digital versions, digitize the analog filters. And for deep technical reasons that I will not get into entirely today, But if you want to learn more, I will point you at this book called uh, DSP Guide. I forget the whole title of the book. Hang on. The full title of the book is The Scientist's and Engineer's Guide to Digital Signal Processing by Stephen Smith. I have mentioned this book many times before in the channel because it is a great introduction to these concepts of digital signal processing. It is somewhat outdated. It's more than 20 years old at this point, but it remains a very good book because the basics haven't changed in the last 20 years. A a digital technology and computers came a long ways, but the fundamental theories behind digital signal processing are still the same. The Fourier transform is the Fourier transform, and it has been the Fourier transform for hundreds of years, at least a hundred years. I don't know when Fourier was born and died. Anyway, so in this book, you will find in-depth of ex explanations as to why things look this way. But here is the summary. On the analog domain, filters and their frequency responses and whatnot look like this. This line, this is an imaginary plane, so it's a plane of imaginary numbers, the real axis is the x-axis, the imaginary part of the number is on the y-axis, these are complex numbers, and the frequency response of the analog filter is sitting right here on the imaginary line, where the real number is zero and the imaginary number goes up and down this y-axis. And on the digital version, when you try to digitize this, you end up with, th with th this analog is 
this analog thing is called the S plane, this representation of the frequency response. And it's not only the representation of the frequency response of the filter, it actually extends to the left and right, so you can ask other questions about the analog filter on this kind of uh, intellectual device. But anyway, when you digitize this, when you apply the so-called Z-transform, you get the so-called Z-plane. So this is the digital version of the analysis of the filter. And in this version, the frequency response, literally what you see on this graph, okay, when I say the frequency response, I mean this graph that shows you the curve, the curves of the filter. On the analog domain, they sit here on the imaginary line, and on the digital domain, they sit here on this uh, circle, on this circle that has a radius of one, and it is, again, on the imaginary plane, so real numbers on the x-axis, imaginary numbers on the y-axis. And why is this a line, and why is this a circle? Well, I suggest you read the book to understand better what this is, and even this these zeros and poles, you will understand better if you read the book. I will not try to explain these things today, because they're not really necessary for me to explain what the cramping is and why it comes about. The reason for the cramping is you are trying to take this line that extends infinitely to the top and infinitely to the bottom, and you are trying to warp this line, you're trying to take this line, stretch it, and pull it apart, and cut it in pieces, and glue some parts together, and make it a circle. That's what you're doing when you're digitizing an analog filter. You're taking an infinite line, and you are turning that into a circle, using mathematics, of course. And note that this line is infinite. But the diameter of this, not the diameter, the circumference, the length of the circumference of this circle is finite. So this line has infinite length, and this circle, it has, I guess, 2 pi, because the length of the um, circumference of the circle is 2 pi r. In the radius is one. So this is a finite length. Something's got to give. You are trying to put some infinite amount of, you're, you're trying to stretch something that is infinite and cramp it down into something that is going to be finite. And think about a bell, a bell shape, for instance. Think about a bell shape, this band and think about how it works in the analog world. In the analog world, we would like for this to have an ideal response, of course, with real resistors, capacitors, transistors, and op-amps, and so forth. You will not get the ideal response, but with ideal components, you would get an ideal response where this band is uh, boosting some frequencies, in this case around 3K and by about 7.5 dB, but ideally, it would have no influence at, uh, whatsoever at zero hertz and no influence at infin infinite hertz, infinity. And that's because at the cutoff frequency, at 3 kilohertz, it should do this amount of boosting. But then as you go away from that cutoff frequency, it should boost less and less and less. So as you distance yourself from the cutoff frequency, the effect of that filter should be attenuated. And in the extremes, at zero hertz and infinity hertz, it should have no influence at whatsoever. It should be a completely zero uh, effect from this, uh, from, from this filter, from this curve, from this EQ band. So, Coming back here to our little diagrams, it means that at 3.7 kilohertz, so let's say that this point here is 3.7 kilohertz, it will do some attenuation, or I guess in that case, some boost. 
And then at zero hertz, which is right here, DC, that should be a zero. And then infinitely to the top, that should be a zero as well. So far, so good. We have an infinite line. So talking about infinity here makes a lot of sense. But when we take this line and wrap it around this circle, infinity is right here. Infinity is right there. That's my, my cursor is in infinity. Isn't that crazy? So my cursor is right here where the end of this line lives. So at this point, the response should be zero. At this point, which is DC, this point corresponds to that point. So at that point, it should be zero. At that point, it should be zero. And somewhere around here, let's say that this is three points, uh, that this is, yeah, three kilohertz. Three, this is three kilohertz. At this point, it should boost by seven and a half TB. But now we don't have infinite distance between this point and that point. We have a finite distance between this, this point and that point. So you see where this is going. The filter eventually has to get back to zero. It's getting back to zero here at Nyquist. In my case, my sampling rate is 48 kilohertz. So the Nyquist frequency is 24 kilohertz, half of the sampling rate. So it has to get back to zero there. And that's why it starts to cramp out of shape because it wants to get back to zero. So it tries to be a good fellow and rise about the same slope as it was doing here, at about the same rate. For, of course it fails to, but it tries to do that as much as possible. But after the cutoff frequency, it's like, okay, now I need to rush and get back to zero as soon as I can at 24 kilohertz instead of infinity hertz. That's cramping. That's why digital filters have to cramp. To the best of my knowledge, I'm gonna say this again, I am not a specialist, I'm not a filter designer. I'm an enthusiast. That's what I learned from my research. That's why filters have to cramp. Right, let's get to the chat. People can correct my mistakes and then we can move on with the other things I wanna talk about. Um, okay, the new messages are, I've been a Reaper user for many years, but definitely prefer using Mixbus for these days due to the workflow and overall features. Fair point. Um, Right. Let me get back to my notes here. Just make sure that I didn't forget anything. Juan is here. Hello. What's up? Okay, next. If this is cramping, how can you fix it? I know of two ways. The first way is kind of a brute force solution. It's kind of sweeping the problem under the hug. The solution is if we are if we have to cramp near Nyquist, okay, so be it. Let's just oversample. You can oversample the plugging, and then you push the Nyquist frequency one octave up. It is still going to, uh, the, the filter is still going to cramp, but it's going to cramp one octave above. It's going to cramp now that this is oversampling at two times. The, the cramping will occur near 48 kilohertz because it's running at double of my sampling rate. My sampling rate is 48 kilohertz. It's going to run at 96 kilohertz. The plugin is going to run at 96 kilohertz. The new Nyquist frequency is 48 kilohertz. So it's still going to cramp just the same, but it's going to cramp all the way up, way above the hearing range. If people are on the chat agreeing with me that they cannot hear anything above like 15, 16K, sometimes even 11, if they cannot hear anything above that, let alone something around 30 kilohertz where the cramping would happen. It's way above the range that we can hear. No one cares about cramping in that case. And I say that this is kind of a brute force approach. First, because it's not solving the problem, it's just pushing the problem further up the frequency spectrum. And also, 
oversampling is CPU intensive. Even re-EQ, which is almost free in terms of CPU, when I turn on oversampling, it's taking about 0.3% CPU. So if the only way we knew how to decrimp a filter was to oversample, then the argument on that Harrison console response video from Saturday would be 100% true because oversampling is CPU intensive. And if you were oversampling every equalizer on your whole session because of some cramping at high frequencies that some people don't even get to hear, that would be a bad trade-off in my books. So oversampling is not the best solution in this scenario because we do know how to design filters that don't cramp without resorting to oversampling. Oh, and there is another thing to talk about when it comes to oversampling. Typically, to oversample, you will want to have some anti-aliasing filters on the upsampling and downsampling steps, or maybe just one of the two, but at least in one of the two, you will want to have some anti-aliasing filters. You probably want these filters to be zero, to be um, uh, linear phase, and in that case, you have to introduce latency. So there are two disadvantages to decramping filters with oversampling. The first disadvantage is CPU. The second disadvantage is latency. You probably will need to introduce latency. Can you do oversampling without latency? Yes, you can. Um, but then you introduce some phase problems, right? When you are doing anti-aliasing filters, they are low-pass filters, you will not change only the, the magnitude, you will not change only the frequency response, but you will also change the phase response, that's the red thing here. And the phase response would be messed up, which could interact badly with all sorts of other things. So people tend to do oversampling with latency, and that's what we see here. Okay, so Oversampling is typically done, but it's not the best idea. Can we do something else? Yes, we can. There may be several options. I know of one. <laughs> I know of one, and that's the one we are going to implement today. And that is the so-called matched filters. I guess they're matching analog curves better. I don't know why they're called matched filters. I think that's why. But what you're doing that technique is when you're converting from the analog ideal response to digital, so when you are going to this picture here, what you do is you change the rules of the game. You adapt the analog filter before the conversion to digital. So you start with the ideal analog curves, then you adapt these curves, then you do these transformations that get you a digital filter. And for instance, for this kind of curve here, what you can do is say, okay, at zero hertz, the response is zero. Ideally, at 17.7 .7 kilohertz, the response is plus 6.9 dB. But at Nyquist, the response is not zero. So we are essentially not taking the infinite point here anymore to be zero. Sorry, I said Nyquist, didn't I? I said Nyquist, I said it wrong. We are talking about analog filters for a moment. We are adapting an analog filter. So this kind of response is zero attenuation and zero boosting at zero hertz this much boost by this at this frequency and in your box standard analog filters you would have zero boost or cut at infinity that's what we start with an analog filter will have zero gain in this point 6.9 db at this point and zero gain and an infinity and if you try to digitize this that, you end up with a cramped filter. So what you do is, on the analog domain, you move up the infinity point. 
you move that point up, you say that no longer the filter should have a zero uh, boost at infinity. Now it will have some other number, probably not 6.9, not zero, somewhere in between. This somewhere in between is something that you decide using mathematics. But you put that point there, and then you do the analog to digital conversion of the filter. What you end up with is something that looks like this. A decramped filter. Now, notice that this technique works without resorting to oversampling. You get no, no latency, ideally, no latency. And in terms of CPU cost, that's what we are going to test today. Is it a significant difference? As far as I know, there will be a little bit of a difference. Okay, so the decramped filters coefficients are a bit more expensive to compute. So if you are modulating some parameters on the filter, then perhaps that's a problem. But if you just set a filter and let it be, or you automate it on every section of the song, you change the filter a little bit, in those cases, it will make no difference because applying the filter, computing the samples that need to go out of the filter, is pretty much the same computation. It's exactly the same computation for cramped and decramped filters. The difference is in the so-called coefficients. I'm going to show you what those are in a moment. So the coefficients will be different, but computing the filter itself is going to be exactly the same computation. So the performance difference must be in the computation of these decramped coefficients. And this computation is a bit more expand, is a bit more CPU expensive. And that's the theory anyway. We are going to put this to test today by implementing this. But even if it is more expensive, there is still the question of, is it a significant difference? Probably not. In reality, we know, right? We know this. We don't have to test this part. Probably, it's not going to be a significant difference because we have filters like the filters in the Fab Filter plugins, the Pro-Q3 plugin. They perform well. We know that much. But we'll put it to test anyway. And then a question may arise as to like, okay, so is this the be all and all of filters? Usually there are trade-offs. Usually there are good things and bad things about a solution. And of course, that is the case here as well. There are good things about this solution and there are bad things about this solution. The good things I already mentioned, CPU, probably gonna be in the same ballpark, latency, zero, so what's the bad part? The phase response. Typically, the phase response will have a, will cross zero at the cutoff frequency, and when you do this, you are like bulging the, you are changing the analog response ever so slightly before digitizing the filter. When you do that, you mess the phase response a little bit. So the cutoff frequency will not be crossing zero in the phase diagram. This may be an issue if you are doing parallel processing or in other scenarios. This may be an issue. The phase response is something that you care about. This may be an issue. In most cases, people accept that that's a good trade-off because for the most part, we are interested in the magnitude. We are not interested in the phase for the most part when doing this. When doing oversampling, we care about the phase response much more. When doing the anti-aliasing filters in oversamplers, we care about the phase much more. When doing this kind of um, this kind of minimum phase filtering that we tend to do for most of mixing tasks, in that case, the phase response is not the biggest deal. It may be, but in usually is not, but the phase response will be a little bit off of what you would expect. And then the solution for that would be to the so-called uh, minimum phase, natural phase, sorry, it would be to go to the natural phase EQs and to the linear phase EQs. The natural phase EQs work by 
on a nutshell, they work by running the same minimum phase filter forwards and backwards on the audio and then combining the responses. It's a super clever trick that fixes the phase response at the cost of some latency and some extra CPU. And there is a Dan Warrell video showing how to do this kind of by hand on the... So I think the name of the video is like linear phase analog question mark question mark because that seems like a contradiction right linear phase analog seems like a contradiction but he shows how to run the same analog gear forwards and backwards in the audio and then combine the results to get linear phase and there are all sorts of techniques to make this forwards and backwards approach fast and feasible for real time like the fab filter plugin does i know that it does natural phase I don't know how they do it, but they probably do it using this strategy of running the thing forwards and backwards, because when you turn on natural phase, I think it introduces some latency. I forget, but I think it does. And then linear phase filters you can do with a completely different approach using the Fourier transform and convolution, but let's not get into that. So yeah, the disadvantage of this other technique for decrimping filters is that you will get some phase anomalies. And there are some ways to fix that with natural phase and linear phase, but that's beyond the scope of today. That was a lot of talking. <laughs> Let's see what you have to say. Uh, okay, I think I stopped here. You were correct in your assessment so far. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Thanks for the confirmation, because I am speaking about things that are technical and deep and complicated, and I want to make sure that I present this information in the most fair and <laughs> in the most precise way I can. Are CPUs fast enough to oversample, so should not matter? Uh, well, it matters, because you are running some plugins on a hundred tracks, and because you are not just running one filter or one uh, band. You may have something like a low pass with, um, let's say, a slope of 24 dB. That's actually two low passes in a row. Or... Um, yeah, there are ver various reasons why you would want to have filters all around, and if they are adding 0.3% CPU every time, it adds up. It adds up. So, and also in terms of elegance, if there is a brute force way of doing something and there is a more principled way of doing something, then it tends to be better to do the principled thing, even if you cannot hear the difference. Whatever. Justin says, uh, it's a two times cost for the filter computation, and then uh, a fur filter. A, a fur filter is FIR is finite impulse response. That's the linear phase filters that I was talking about. Linear phase filters tend to be implemented with finite impulse response filters, and that's how you do anti-aliasing filters. Uh, Kaidan didn't understand this method you talked about. Can you say that again? I'm happy to say that again, but this has been a while, so please ask again, and I will get to that in a moment. I will get to the bottom of the chat in a moment. So ask again what exactly you didn't understand, and I will be happy to explain it some other way. And hopefully explain it better. <laughs> uh, but if you oversample, you don't need the anti-aliasing filter. Is that the point? You only need anti-aliasing filters when doing oversampling in this context, because these filters that we are talking about today don't introduce any uh, non-linearities. They don't introduce any distortion. There are filters that introduce distortion, just not the ones we are looking at today. So in that context where everything, every processing is linear, you don't need anti-aliasing filters unless you try to oversample. If you try to oversample, you will need anti-aliasing filters. But uh, when I say linear and nonlinear, it may not be 100% clear. 
you can think of this as when we get to the code, we will get to the code in a moment. When we get there, you will see that we are only adding samples and multiplying by constants, the so-called coefficients. So we never multiply samples by samples. We don't do that. We don't use the transcendental functions like tangents and sines and so on on the samples. We will use these functions to compute the coefficients, but in the end, we will get the coefficients. They are constants. We don't take the tangent of a sample. Never do that. We take the tangent of some things, like we may take the tangent of the cutoff frequency. That's all right. But we never take the tangent of the, the samples. The only processing that we do to samples is to multiply by constants and add them up together. These are linear operations. There is a lot more to be said about linear versus nonlinear, but I think that that's a good summary for the discussion we'll have today. Nathan says, looks like you know what you're talking about. I prefer to be in the dark about most of this stuff. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> it's all interesting to talk about, uh, though, thanks. <laughs> I'm happy that you're finding this interesting. Um, you definitely need the anti-aliasing filter for oversampling, otherwise you'll get a perfect mirror copy reflected back from Nyquist and all goes to hell. Yeah, if you want to see this and learn more about this, the way I learned it was from reading the DSP guidebook. So I recommend that. But there are other good books about this, it's just the one that I know. Is the Harrison plugging a white model of the console, like a SPICE model? then the regular filter math won't apply, right? Yeah, so what Bo is asking about is an, actually an interesting question. When they say that every resistor, capacitor, and transistor is included in the model, what is this model? There are different ways to model something. There is the so-called white box approach, where you open the box, you take one of the consoles, you open it up, you trace the circuit, you see where every resistor, capacitor, and transistor is, you model that using SPICE, for instance. We have an, uh, a stream from about eight months ago in which we talk about modeling in SPICE. And you take that model and you run that simulation in the computer. And the computer will do the same thing that the console does, for the most part, as long as your model is accurate. Of course, there, every model will have its inaccuracies, but it will try to simulate what happens to electricity as it flows through each component. That's a white box approach. It's also called physical modeling in this context. And of course, the upside is that as long as your model is a good model, you will have exactly the same response. You can feed any audio through the thing and you will get the same response you would get from the hardware. The downside is that this tends to be computationally expensive. To run a SPICE model in real time is not feasible. Not even for something super simple with a single resistor and a single capacitor. You cannot run this in real time. So to make this performant, there is a whole host of techniques. We talked about some of them Again, there are streams in this channel about this. We talked to uh, Tail about some of this. We talked to Jating Child Hurry. I think that's how you say his last name. I may have forgot how to say his last name, but we talked about this technique and how he modeled the clone center pedal using this. So if you are saying that is included in the model, if you mean a white box approach, an open box approach, then you would have exactly the same response as the hardware and the curves would not cramp because you would not even be using these techniques for filtering that we are going to sh show in the code today. You would be using something entirely different. So we know for a fact from uh, the analysis that Dan Warrow did, I did not reproduce his results. I did not install the Harrison 32C plugin to double check that, but Harrison themselves did not um, claim otherwise, so I didn't bother. Anyway, if they were trying to tell us that this was a white box approach, of course, that's false. We know it's not. We know it is a black box kind of approach in which they 
looked at the response curves from the console and tried to match that as best as they could using the controls in the plugin. And that's also a valid approach. That's what, uh, for instance, uh, a tail showed us how to do. And also John Matthews from Toucan Studios is doing that for the for his emulations of compressors and equalizers and so on. So both uh, approaches, white box and black box, open box, closed box, however you want to call them, both approaches are valid. And when you are designing these things, it is a completely fair thing to say the, the console gives me this curve, I will try to approximate that, but I will implement this with bog standard digital EQs, I will let them cramp, I will make this for performance reasons because no one hears the difference or whatever other explanation you may have, and that's a valid thing to do. It may be a, mis a bit mis disingenuous to try and sell it as something that it may not be, but strictly speaking this isn't false because they don't say white box or physical modeling or any of that. Anyway, take, of, take that as you will. Again, I may be biased. I mentioned in the beginning my biases. Nathan, I've spent some time uh, in the trenches with filters and EQs. Yes, uh, Justin Johnson, for those who don't know, is the creator of re-EQ, not that one, this one. And there is a there are two streams, or maybe three, in which we talked about this, showed the code and the anti-aliasing filters, the oversampling, the curves, everything. And this is one instance of a plugin that knows how to do decramped filters using uh, oversampling. You can see the latency here and the CPU there. So this is using the brute force approach. It is oversampling. And there is an option to go lower quality, and in that case, zero latency, cramping. And at this point, it is similar to, not exactly the same as, similar and in many ways equivalent to ReQ. So yeah, if you use this version of ReQ, not Rea EQ, but ReQ, then you have to thank Justin. M9 says, from what I have seen, people use the oversampling to counter the Nyquist reflection, that is, its dB drops greatly before it hits audible range. Yeah, sort of what we talked about. And yeah, these reflections is what you're trying to get rid of with anti-aliasing filters when you oversample. Uh, Harrison has been in the trenches for decades and knows a thing or two about what is important to a signal path and what isn't. Yes, that's a fair point. In the end, as I mentioned in the beginning, all of this is an academic exercise if you run some tests and you cannot hear a difference or you don't care about the difference, or maybe you prefer the cramped versions. All of those are valid. So in the end, what matters is what is and is an important in the signal path. Juan says, I got lost, thought I was following, but I realized I didn't understand. I will look at the replay, but if you can rephrase a bit, it would help a lot. Yeah, exactly what do you want me to rephrase? The oversampling, the techniques for decramping without oversampling or something else. And John is here. Hey, I was talking about your plugins and how you do uh, closed box approaches. Also, Harrison said they didn't put a Q knob because the original hardware doesn't have it and they were recreating it. Fair point. Uh, when, say, when you're saying that you're recreating something or that you're modeling something, those terms are loose. There is no formal definition of what it means to recreate or model something. So if you're trying to recreate the workflow using standard digital filters, is okay. If you're trying to recreate the non-linearities, the distortion, the saturation of the console, then probably you would not want to use a pure digital EQ because you would like for the saturation of that EQ curve to be in the plugin. But the Harrison 32 C is not trying to bring any saturation. And whether it should, it's a whole different story that I will not get into. Aviated View Sound is here. Hello, what's up? Um, Nathan says the 
phrase on the website is correct and there is documentation to back it up. Oh, yeah, okay, so in that case, well, as I said, it's kind of, it's not incorrect, it's kind of misleading because when I read this, I think physical modeling, but that may be just me. And in terms of documentation to back it up, I would love to hear more about this because I'm not sure what you're talking about right now, but I would love to see that. Uh, do you have a link to the document? Oh yeah, so same question. <laughs> Do you have a link to the documentation? I would love to see that. So strictly speaking, is this incorrect? It's not, because you may have looked at the thing as a black box, see the curves, and then in that case, you are looking at every capacitor, transistor, and uh, resistor in there because you ran audio through the thing, right? <laughs> oh, I see. I understand cramping and why oversampling is brute force. Your method about condensing something and not taking the sample? Your method about condensing something and not taking the sample. Not sure you understand that. There are blogs being created that talks about all these details. If those documents can be shared, it's not up to me. You will need to talk to the engineers who were involved. Fair enough. Um, so, right, let's do two tests to try and determine the very specific question. We are not talking about the whole conversation of analog modeling, what it means, how to communicate that to your customers, none of that. We will try to answer one question and we'll try to answer it as precisely as we can. The question is, what's the performance difference between cramped and decramped EQs? And we will do two tests. First, we will look at one implementation that was not created by us. Then we will create an implementation from scratch for both cramped and decramped filters, and we will compare their performance. So we will compare the performance of a plugin that was created by someone else and a plugin that we created ourselves, starting with a plugin that someone else created. So what are the contenders? We would like a plugin that is capable of doing cramped and decramped filters. We saw that re-EQ and re-EQ are not fit for this because both of them rely on oversampling, the brute force approach. And we know that that will be slower. That's not the, the question that we are trying to answer. We can also not use something like the FabFilter Pro Q3. First, because I don't have it. I don't have that money. I didn't buy the plugin, but I could install a demo. But they don't have cramped filters. <laughs> they don't have cramped filters. They only have decramped filters. So, and we also don't know exactly what they're doing. We know that they are not oversampling, but we don't, don't know exactly what technique they use. But whatever, they don't have decramped filters, so we cannot make a fair comparison. But there is... Uh, there are plugins that have both cramped and decramped curves. There is the Cubase stock plugin that has both kinds, but I don't have Cubase. But there is another one by Melda Production that has both kinds of curves. So that's what we are going to look at today. The Melda Equalizer. And in our tests, we will do two tests with the Melda Equalizer and with our own implementation. In each test, we will do three assessments, three things we will look at. First is, do they have the curves that they claim to be? Because every equalizer that we will look at will have one of these graphs. And for instance, here we can see that this shape is cramping. But do we trust this graph? The graph was developed by the same people who designed the, who developed the code for the filter. Can we trust them? No. So we will not trust the, the thing here. We will do a test with the uh, Burton EQ uh, yeah, Bur Burton EQ curve analyzer. This is kind of like the plugin doctor that many people know, but it runs in the DAW. It's not a standalone host for plugins. It runs in the DAW, and we will write some JS effects later. So it's good that we have something that runs in the DAW. So we will look at the curves in this. So that's the first assessment. The second assessment is latency, because the plugin may be internally oversampling, perhaps with a linear phase anti-aliasing filter that will introduce latency, but it may not be declaring that latency to the host. So it may be hiding away, it may be lying to the host, and we don't trust, we don't trust this. 
We don't trust these guys. We will do our own test to see if it's introducing any latency that hasn't been reported. And then the third test, of course, is put some automation on this and look at the performance, the CPU use. All right, so first, let's look at the response curve. Is it really cramping? It really is cramping, isn't it? You can see this shape going all the way out. And let's try and bring this to 24 kilohertz. It doesn't go up to 24, isn't that great? But it goes close enough. Uh, granted, I'm using an old version, so maybe they implemented, Burton has implemented this uh, respecting the sampling rate of the host. But anyway, so it is cramping out of shape. It's pretty clear. So now let's go to right-click, peak analog, and then there you go, decramped filters. That's what they look like. And let's look at them closely for a second. You can see that on the audible spectrum that goes up to here, this is 20k, 20 kilohertz, the curve is perfectly flat, at least to my eyes and it never goes out of shape, never, never gets, gets thinner. It is the same width the whole time. And yeah, I understand that it's going up and down, but that's because I'm moving this and this lets me go up and down as well. Perhaps I can go there and change just the frequency so the graphs look a little better. Yeah, that's better. So you can see it's moving left and right. It's never getting out of shape. It's never getting thinner or thicker. This is what decramped curves look like. Again, no oversampling. Uh, you can also see that beyond and above the hearing spectrum around here, the filter does get a bit weird, but that's okay. That is just an artifact of the the technique used to decrimp the filter, and we don't hear this part anyway. So that's okay. That's, expect, that's actually the trade-off. That's how you can decrimp the filter. So it is passing test number one. No cramping. Well, actually both. We have both versions. We can look at both, both versions and see if it will make any difference in terms of performance. Second test is in terms of latency. Are they introducing latency and not telling us? I have a feeling that it is not introducing latency because when it introduces latency, this graph goes wacky because you have to compensate for the latency to show the face correctly. Let me, let me show you what I mean by that by introducing some artificial latency. See, the graph gets all weird and crazy when latency is incorrect. So this is good indication that the latency is okay, that it's not introducing fake latency or not reporting the latency to the host. But still, here is the decramped filter. Let's have an item drop, perhaps. Mm, I want to say something like a tone generator. Glue that, copy that, and lower the volume for this one. Glue that. And then we have a sharp transition between these two points. And we can render the plugin here and we will see this if this sharp transition moves left and right. It will change in shape because filter filter to filter something in the frequency domain means to change the shape in the time domain. So this will change shape, but we will it move left and right? That's the question. To answer that, let's drop the plugin there on the item and I will make a copy of it. I will zoom all the way in. And then on the second, I will glue a burning the effect into the item. No latency. It didn't move left and right. No latency. Great. So the only thing left to do is to create two tracks. 
in one track we will put the melda equalizer and we will take band 4 we will put it at a high frequency in some gain something that makes the cramping pretty clear that's that's pretty clear to me let's copy that to the other track change the type to peak analog no cramping again here are they side by side here are them side by side cramping not cramping then all you gotta do is make a bunch of copies because when we are looking at one band on one instance of the plugin it is uh, too small of a number to make any difference in both cases it's 0.1% CPU but let's see how this changes as I put more and more instances on the track so let's say 2 4 H 16 32 and we are getting 0.6% CPU let's go 64 64 instances is registering about 1% CPU which is a fair thing also another thing that may influence the tests oh God damn it! I forgot to automate the curve before I copied it. I will have to do that that part again. But another thing that could influence this is to have some audio running through because of problems with the normalization and very small numbers. We talked about that in plenty of other streams. So what I will do is have another track with some good old white noise, and I will route that to both tracks so both tracks will receive exactly the same noise and everything is clipping so i will bring down the white noise but both tracks are receiving the same noise so it is kind of a fair comparison in the sense that they are working with exactly the same sound simultaneously yeah okay so i will have to touch the frequency param modulation and force the plugin to recompute the internal coefficients. I forgot that part. So there you go. Now it is decramped, uh, sorry, it is cramped in this version and it is moving left and right like a mad little EQ curve. And then I will redo this part where I copy, change the band type. Ah, it's funny, I have to right-click the band, but now it's moving. <laughs> I can also click here. And this is the decramped version. And we can see that it's moving up and it's not cramping. Good enough. So now it is... This is the test that I wanted to do. Audio is running through the thing. Coefficients have to be recomputed internally. Or not, depending on how they do the... Implementation of the filter, but the bog standard digital EQs will have to recompute internal coefficients. So let's go over this again. Let's try and make 64 instances. We have 1, 2, 4, H, 16. Hang on. Yeah, something broke. <laughs> when I started to copy the thing over and over, it started to break. I'm not sure if the stream is all right, because if it was my CPU getting to its knees because of all the parameter recomputation, then maybe the stream is affected. Let me know if you have some problems hearing me and seeing me. Um, yeah, we'll do that modulation again and try again. Aviated View Sound says, 
What about using an infinite impulse response with topology preserving transform to do the EQ in Reaper? Yeah, the implementation we will do today is not using TPT, the topology preserving transform, but it's a cool topic. We will just not get into it today. But yeah, once you get the coefficients, doing a typical digital filter is a two-step process. First, you compute the coefficients using the parameters. So given a, a certain frequency Q and gain, you, introduce, you, you compute the coefficients. And the second step is to use these coefficients to actually process the samples. This is the step that I said is exactly the same for cramped versus decramped filters. And there are different ways of going about this. TPT is one of the best ways of going about this. We, when we implement our own version, we will go with the simple <laughs> version, not TPT. TPT is more complicated. We will do direct form, the simplest thing, but TPT is one of the best way of doing this. And I'm not sure how Melda is doing it. We could replicate the thirdness of the hardware, the 3D-ness of the hardware. 3D is usually a discrepancy in stereo signal. Not sure this is a joke. I don't think it's a joke, but I don't understand it. But we benefit from it in stereo. Also, it could provide additional depth on top of the harmonics. What? I think I'm not following that part of the conversation. <laughs> John Matthews is reacting to the fact that I didn't buy the Fab Filter plugins. <laughs> I did not. And keep the low from breaking when used for compressor frequency response. Yeah. Plugin Doctor is now a plugin as well as standalone. I didn't know that. That's great. Now I need to get it. Cool. I guess it's it's got popular enough. Anybody use the Acoustica plugins? How are they doing it? Convolution? I don't know. Okay, the stream is fine. And it's much such fun. Awesome. <laughs> You will probably want to rewind and watch the explanation of why filters cramp in the first place. I think that that's a nice explanation, if it is correct. Yeah, all the land lovers are now sick. Uh, okay, uh, why did it go bad? I don't know. Maybe I can undo to get back into the working stage, or maybe I can just get rid of that and copy that from there to here. Oh, god damn it. Something about the test is not going to work well for us because parameter modulation doesn't go with... Oh, it does go with... I understand what's happening. Relax, you all. I understand what is happening. The filter is boosting. When it boosts, it increases the volume. When I put a hundred of them in the track, what happens is Reaper, tur uh, Reaper enables the auto mute because it gets too loud. That's what's up. So all we gotta do is in the in these tests for them to be fair is lower the output gain on the whole plugging, which is something that you can do in the utilities. No, which is something you can do. Which is something you can do somewhere on the interface. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you cannot. Yeah, this is going to do some mid-side thing. Not even sure what that is. God damn it. Let's start with the white noise all the way down. We'll start with the white noise all the way down, and then we'll bring it up. And if necessary, we can turn off auto-mute. That's what we'll do. From the top. Melda equalizer. Let's do the setup again. Melda equalizer. Band number four. Bring it up. Or maybe bring it down. It's gonna be quieter, but it's still gonna cramp just the same and we'll not have problems with volume buildup. Yeah, let's do that. So now I can bring the white noise back up and there are no outputs, so it's okay for me to turn off auto mute if it comes to that. Okay, so we will do this. We will take the frequency and modulate that. For 
frequency parameter modulation LFO and then there it goes and I guess I will modulate this a bit slower so that we can see the cramping no I will do it somewhat fast because we can still see the cramp if we look closely and we know what we are doing I am doing it live and also because the faster it goes the more it has to recompute the coefficients so it is a better stress test okay good setup good setup let's move it over there and here we will change the type to peak analog and we can see that it's not cramping it's good enough now let the whole thing is right no nah, nah, it's all right i'm gonna copy things one instance two instances four eight and 16 and 32. at 32 we got to one percent cpu around one percent so it was 32 instances am i right um how do i count this it was 32 did i forget something it was 32. correct me in the chat if i'm wrong because i can also go to the project bay uh, or i can do i can do this No, I thought he was going to ask me, do you want to copy 32 instances? I, I did 32. I did 32. I'm confident I, I remember. I did 32. So now let's do 32 of these. Two, four, eight, 16, 32. So this is decramped. Here is the CPU use. And here is cramped. And here is the CPU use. Now we watch. And they are about the same. They're going to go up and down differently. The difference may be that this is always slower by a small margin, but the margin seems to be small enough that it's not significant. So in the Melda production, implementation that's all we can say right so far in the melda production implementation of the peak filter with cramped and decramped curves the cpu use difference is negligible and it is a correct implementation we saw in the burton eq analyzer we saw that the latency is zero the Melda production plugin implemented decramped filters in a way that does not affect performance significantly. That's my conclusion. So that was test number one. What I'm going to do to these tracks is mute them. And I will call this the third party test. And I will mute these tracks. And the reason why I am doing this with uh, free plugins. This is not stock Reaper plugin, but it's free. And the uh, white noise is stock. And we will write some JS effects that I will include in the project. And I will share the project because I want research to be reproducible. Is that the word? You will be able to run this at home. And maybe you will find a difference because maybe on my computer, with ha which has a M1 processor, it's macOS running macOS 12.6. Uh, so all these this parameters of the test must be taken in account. So you should run this on your machine as well and see if you can reproduce my results. That's a big important thing. And there are ways to, to make a difference, right? You can see if you're running in macOS, do some things differently in C++. The Melda Productions plugin uh, is a native plugin, it's not JS effects. So it can do things differently in different operating systems. It can try to optimize things and do uh, SIMD, same instruction, multiple data. So it can optimize things in various ways that would affect the results. 
you should run these tests as well. I will create a folder here real quick that I will call um, cramp. <laughs> so you will be able to run these tests because I will share the Reaper project at the end. All right, let's see the comments before we get to code. <laughs> I said in the beginning of the stream, as I always do, let's write some code together. It has been one hour and a half and I have been talking. <laughs> but we will write some code. <laughs> we will, right now, we will start writing some code. If I remember correctly, Acoustica are using some form of Volterra convolution. I don't know what that is. I need to take note of things that I need to look up later. I need to get the VSC version of this. Auto mute, exactly. <laughs> Fun story. Output at the top. Oh my God, Aria is here. Hello, Aria. I was watching this from the beginning, not realizing that it's ongoing. <laughs> At the top, dry, wet, etc. Hi, Aria. Wouldn't lowering the output from EQs affect the result? I want to prevent auto mute, just disable master send and auto mute. <laughs> Fair point. I could have done that. But from a performance perspective, from a CPU perspective, I don't think it makes any difference. It will still have to compute coefficients all the same. It will have to do the processing of the samples in pretty much the same way or if it's doing something else that is not your box standard digital EQ, it will do some other computation. But I don't think that boosting instead of cutting would change the CPU performance. But I will let you, Juan, download the Reaper project when it's done at the end of the stream and try this for yourself. Instead of cut, boost and try it and let me know. I don't think it makes a difference, but I'm not going to test it. I will let this to you, Juan. And now you need to get back to me and tell me how it goes. And for people who want to follow along, now it's a great time to promote. The link is in the description. You can go to my website, go to the Discord chat, and you will find many of us here on this stream, there on the chat, and we can continue the conversation. Right. Um, I hear someone on Skype. This is the Skype chat with uh, people who are contacted from Dan Warrow to Harrison to then from the, I forget the name, from the Lonely Rocker YouTube channel. And some of my colleagues like Justin Johnson, Thiel. So this is the chat with everyone. And Martin is the person who developed, I'm not sure if it's Martin, Martin. You can tell me how you pronounce your name. Uh, this is the person who de designed the decrimped filters that we are going to implement in a couple minutes. And what they are saying is, thinking about why digital filters cramp, I think the best explanation is, they don't do that per se. Uh, only if we design them in a particular way using the bilinear transform, yeah, that's one of the techniques for the, the bilinear transform is one of the techniques and the one that people learn first, right? It's one of the most straightforward techniques for going from digital to, sorry, from analog to digital. So anyway, using the bilinear transform, they do. So yeah, cramping is an artifact of a particular technique for doing this conversion. It's not a, a, a an intrinsic property of digital filters. This design method is simple and popular, but by no means the only way. And yes, that is what I tried to convey. And Martin, you are here on the call, you are muted, but you seem to be on the Skype call. So if you want to turn on your microphone, I'm happy to bring you into the stream. If you don't want to do that, that's fine too. But I think you are hearing me and seeing everything that's going on. So I would love if you could confirm that because I want to make sure that you know I am broadcasting your messages. Yeah, I, I hear you, and you're doing a fantastic job hey. explaining things. So, just just go on with it. Okay, okay, and okay. Ignore my comments, nerdy comments. Yeah. All right, all right. So, yeah. First of all, thank you very much for joining the call, and thank you very much for designing and publishing your uh, filters. Because 
they were like a, a rabbit hole that I went into and so much fun and uh, such generosity of you to publish this because many people develop these filters, but they keep them in house. So it's very nice of you to, to share this knowledge and to answer to my emails and join us on the chat here. It is uh, a blast to have you. So thank you very much. All right, so with that said, um, there, let's talk about first the, the, the implementation of the simple, the simple bilinear transform, uh, the bog standard EQs that everyone learns how to implement when they first learn how to implement an equalizer. And it is something that we have implemented um, at least two times before here on this stream, but we are gonna do it a third time because I want this to be self-contained. And uh, I want to show how the implementation goes because it's a stepping stone to the decramped version. And uh, I also want to have this implementation that we do ourselves because I want to have implementations that are similar. So they're both going to be JS effects. They're both going to be using the same coding style. They're both going to be implemented by the same person. So I think it will be a fair way of comparing the same way that I was doing Melda to Melda instead of doing Fab Filter to ReQ kind of thing. When we talk about CPU, I think that that matters. So. The box standard digital EQ that everyone goes to when they're first learning about this, including myself, is the RBJ um, Robert Bristol Johnson Audio EQ Cookbook. This document has been around since forever, and it is pretty straightforward to turn into code. So probably the first time you read this document, it will be a bit confusing unless you are experienced in the area, but I wasn't when I first learned, uh, when I first read this document, I was like, I don't understand 90% of this. And then I just kept reading it. And now I understand something about this. <laughs> it is a process. And when you first see this, there are all these equations. It may be a bit scary. It is a document that is like a cookbook. It is written for the initiated. It's written for people who know what digital filters are, what the analog prototypes are, and they are just trying to get a quick and dirty filter. And they come here, they find the formulas, they are out. But the way that these filters that we are going to implement, uh, the way that they were des designed is exactly what I explained before. You start with the analog response, which for example, we will turn today to on the implementation, we could implement all the types, but we are interested in the performance. So we're going to look at one type. We will use the bandpass. So we will use one of these two, it doesn't matter which, but we will look at these two. And um, the way that this was designed was with this equation, for instance, this is the equation that represents the analog response curve. It's a, a so-called transfer curve of the analog filter. We can tell that it's analog because the variable name is S, S plane, see? What is this S? I, I will let the DSP guidebook explain that to you. It's a variable in the uh, complex number space. Anyway, so uh, we will look at this, this equation and that's in the analog. It uh, then RBJ, Robert Bristow Johnson used the bilinear tra transform technique to turn that into a digital filter. And these are the equations you can pretty much just copy and paste and you will have something that works. And there are two flavors of bandpass filters. I guess we will go with this one because it looks a bit less scary, but it doesn't really matter. The two are kind of equivalent. It's just the 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 way that the game works is different. But we'll go with this one. And for that, I will open a new effect. I will call this Leafac RBJ. Or you know what? I think I can do even better. I learned something from Theo about Reaper that is super cool. Let's add a folder to the workspace that is the downloads folder and I call this cramp. And I'm not sure this is going to work, but 
if I remember correctly, you can create an effects folder in a Reaper project and you can dump effects there. I guess I will call this RBJ. And let's just put a slider there. And then if you have a Reaper project with a folder called effects and some effects in there, they become available in the project. And I will call this JS effects. And this will be nicer when I share the project, the JS effects will come along for the ride, which will be a fine way of sharing this. So what I have to do now is call RBJ, project RBJ JS effects, and here is the hello slider. That works, awesome. So let's also take the cookbook and put it to the side. Like so. And we can close this and now we have everything side by side, which I tend to like. So, in JS effects, there are several sections of code. The sample section is what runs on every sample and you have access to the input audio and you have to produce the output audio. So in that section, we will want to use the coefficients and run the filter. We will use the direct form that is here, direct form number one. Coming back to the conversation on the chat about uh, topology and preserving transforms, that is a smarter way of doing this. But we will do the simple thing, which is this. Now, naturally, this copy and paste is not 100% going to work in JS effects because this is not exactly JS effects syntax. So let's massage this to make it JS effects syntax. First, all these brackets have to go. We will turn all of them into underscores. And the end brackets, we will just remove like so. Second, this n minus one variables underscores there as well. Otherwise, JS effects will think of this as subtraction. But other than that, the whole syntax is actually JS effects. You do use asterisk for multiplication, minus signs for subtraction, of course, equal signs, and even the parentheses make sense. But there is, since we are talking about performance, there is one little performance consideration, and that is the coefficients here, this numbers. Uh, no, I'll get to that in a moment. Let's backtrack. So this is the formula. But what are Y's and X's and A's and B's? Let's demystify that. The X's are the inputs. They are the, the audio that is coming in. And in the case of the RBJ filters, we have to have access to three samples. We have to have access to the current sample. In JS effects, you represent the current sample by SPL0 and I'm only doing the left channel. But that's all right, because I will be consistent. I will only do the left channel in every plugin that we write. So I'm doing only doing the left channel. And so that's the current input. Now we need to also have access to the previous input. So when we have uh, the good old Reaper timeline here, Um, let's put a tone generator in there and glue it and zoom. So you will have access to one of these dots. That's one sample. That's SPL0. But we also need for this formula to work the previous sample and the previous to previous sample. That's what X and minus one and X and minus two are the previous and the previous to previous samples. So we don't have direct access to that, but what we can do is a little trick and move things around. So here is how this goes. The first time that we receive the first sample, so we are all the way to the left of the timeline, 
the plugin is going to start running and it is going to receive this first dot right here on the line. In that case, all the variables that have no value assigned to them, like these variables, they are all zeros. So this variable is a zero to begin with, this variable will be a zero because of that, and this variable is a zero to begin with, and this variable will be a zero because of that. Then xn will be SPL0, which is this first sample. Then it will run this formula and it will loop around but when it loops around, it does not forget the existing values of the variables. So this time, this is still zero, and that's zero, but this is not zero, this is the previous sample. So this will become one sample ago. So when the cursor is here on the second sample, x of n is this sample, and x of n minus one is the previous one and so on and so forth. When we get to the third sample, then x of n will be the third sample, but x of n minus one will be the previous, and x of n minus two will be the previous to previous. And that's how it goes. So now the axes are all set up. We are shuffling things around, and uh, we have these variables. We also need, so, y of n we are defining with the formula, but these two variables we need to update in pretty much the same way, because y is the output, and we need to produce the output for the current sample, but we also need to have access to the previous outputs for this formula to work. So we can write it like this. So now it's going to happen in pretty much the same way. On the first sample, y of n minus 1 and y of n minus 2 are going to be zeros. This is going to be zero as well. And then we compute the result of the filter for the first sample. Then the next time we go around, this will still be zero, this will still be zero, but this will be the result of the previous run. So this will be the output of the filter for the previous sample. That's what we end up with here, and that's what's used in the formula. And so on and so forth, in pretty much the same way. So this is the setup we need to have the x's and y's in place. Next, we need to deal with the a's and b's. These are the so-called coefficients I kept bringing up. These are the numbers that we compute when you provide me with the frequency, the, uh, the gain and the q. With the frequency, the gain, and the q, I'm able to compute these coefficients, and then I apply them here. So when I am processing samples, this is all I do. I just apply the coefficients, but I also need to compute them to begin with. And that's why I got, now you can see in the code, that's why I said that if you have a very straightforward digital filter, the performance, the CPU use will not change depending on whether your uh, filter is cramped or not, because you will just compute these coefficients and this line is going to be the same. This line is going to appear in pretty much the same form when we implement the decramped versions as well. So this is the, the core of the, the filter, actually. This is the direct form one that you saw in the cookbook. And also, I should also do some other, some other bookkeeping here, and that is to say uh, that the outputs of the filter are this, because we want to see the outputs on the Burton EQ analyzer, and we also probably want to hear the outputs in the listening tests when you download the Reaper project and put some of your own material in this project. Anyway, so to output something, we will make this mono. Again, it doesn't matter because we will be consistent when we implement the decrimped version and we are only testing the performance. We will check the correctness, but the topic of today is the CPU use. So it doesn't matter that I'm not doing stereo properly. But anyway, now the output is just Y of N. And that's all there is to the sample block, the sample section of the code. This is all we need to do audio processing. I will line things up so it looks better. Now let's go into the slider section. And the slider section will compute the coefficients 
based on the frequency gain and Q. So I will need sliders for this. I will have the frequency. We'll start at 1K. You may go from 20 to 20,000 in steps of one hertz. I will also have a slider for gain and it will be zero to begin with. You will be able to go from minus 12 to, uh, I guess maybe 18. It doesn't matter, 24. <laughs> you will be able to go from minus 24 to 24 in terms of dB. And also a Q. Does it make sense to have a Q on a band pass? I think it does, but I may be misremembering. So if I have a band pass, yeah, it matters. And that will be our Q. And Q will go from 0.1, I guess the default will be 707, because that's the square root of, it's one over the square root of two. For technical reasons, we'll go with that. That's the Q that doesn't give us any resonance in low pass and high pass filters, whatever. Uh, so we'll be able to go from 0.1 to 3 in steps of 0 0.01, and that's our Q. And this doesn't have a unit. It's a measurement that doesn't have a unit, isn't that crazy? Anyway, with these three numbers, we will have to compute these variables. Let's put all of them in the code here real quick. So we put all the ingredients on the table. And let's check what people are saying here on the YouTube chat. Yeah, Leandro, please check your formulas. Y and Y and minus one and Y and minus two, they look odd. Please check your formulas for those variables. Let's check the formula for those variables. Perhaps what you are saying is that it looks odd because of these divisions. I will get to that in a moment. But if it's not dash, then I'm not sure what you mean. So please explain what you mean. What do you think is odd about this? I don't see anything wrong. Yeah, I, I'm unable to see something wrong. Maybe when we test the plugin, of course it will come up, but no, compare with X, N, etc. Oh, I think I see what I mean. Thanks for catching that. So it should be this. Thank you. Thanks for catching that. Yeah, the indices were wrong. We have to update things in order like this. Yeah, that, that's right. Thank you. Okay, uh, these are what we get from the cookbook. So let's go to the bandpass filter on the cookbook. And again, I will use this version because it looks a bit less scary than that version. Again, I will copy and paste stuff. And let's check what is JS effects syntax, what is not JS effects syntax, and the variables that we may still be missing. So let's see first if we covered everything. I will source these lines and I will compare to this line. So we have A0 to A2, B0 to B2, B0 to B2, A0 to A2. It all checks out. And I will have uh, a look at the syntax. So Everything looks like correct JS effects syntax to me, but we are still missing what the definition of alpha and W0, which actually is um, the character that you have on the keyboard, but this is actually an omega when you're writing papers. So I will call this omega zero or the angular frequency, if you want to be fancy about this. 
Anyway, so we need to now compute alpha and w0, and you know, you may note that I'm putting these variables above because they're necessary here, so they need to have already been defined. And then I closed the cookbook, so let's open it again and find the definition of alpha. The definition of alpha. 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 There you go. So this is the definition of alpha. And this is the case for when you have a Q. There are three ways to define the slope. We are using Q, but there, uh, for instance, in re-Q, it uses bandwidth, not Q. So that's another way. And in the cookbook here, you can decide to use bandwidth instead. And S is for slope. There are three ways. But we are using Q, so we are using this formula. And then I will actually take this part as well. Boop. And put it there. Boop. Semicolon. This is a standard JS effect syntax, so everything is okay. And this Q is coming from there. Now we need the formula for W0, which is right there. And this isn't really JS effect syntax. Pi wants to have a dollar sign in JS effects. And then we have these two variables that we don't have. F0 is defined above as where it's happening, man. It's the cutoff frequency, the shelf midpoint, the filter type, the significant frequency. It is what we called frequency. And FS is the sampling rate, if I am remembering correctly. Yes, yeah, the sampling frequency in JS effects that's available to us as S rate. So there you have it. With that, we don't have anything else that we are missing. So let's give this a spin. Before I do, let me just read this over again to see if I'm not missing anything. For one thing, I don't think we used gain. So the bandpass filter doesn't have gain. That's okay. I will remove the slider for that because I one thing that a pet peeve of mine is when a plugin has a control that is not in effect. I hate that. <laughs> Gray it out, remove it from the interface, but don't let it just stand there. Do something about it. Okay. Second pass, just to make sure. And I did not hear any chirp from Skype, so I think that <laughs> Martin is not spotting any other mistake. Thanks for catching this one. I would be such a fool spending half an hour trying to find this one out. <laughs> and I will also consult the chat, because people sometimes find mistakes and they let me know in the chat. And then we'll give this a try. Um, Uh, sounds good. Are you knowledgeable on how to implement convolutions? The answer is yes. We talked about this with Justin on the stream. He implemented convolution in re-EQ by hand because it was faster. And when I say by hand, <laughs> I mean the code is huge and he wrote it by hand. It's fantastic. Uh, normal convolution, not too bad. Volterra convolution, not a clue. Fair enough. <laughs> Uh, where was I? The thing auto scrolls from time to time. It's kind of tricky. Hey, you all, um, save and upload the Reaper file. We, I will do that. At the end of the stream, there will be a link in the description for the Reaper project for you to do three things. Drop some of your, your own material, some of your, your own tracks into this project and try and hear the difference between cramped and decramped. And then test the CPU use. And I said three things, but I forget. Uh, ben is here. Hey, what's up? This is Ben from Harrison. You are doing a great job here. Thanks. Before you move on, well, I guess I have moved on, but I will try and answer now. Can you know the cramped with the non-cramped channel? Presumably all the frequencies will be very high frequencies. I agree, and I will try. This is the most acid test 32 instances at 18 dB each. This is the most acid test. 32 instances at 18 dB each. I went with 32 instances. I'm not sure it was at 18. I just put whatever gain. 
and moving, I did that. But let's answer your question about a null. So again, I will take two tracks, put them there, route my white noise to both, put the Melva equalizer, and I guess the 18 dB point is a good point, perhaps I will try and do that, no, we don't have gain in the band pass, but uh, it's something, homework for you, uh, try and run the, the tests with 18 dB as opposed to whatever I did, uh, it was 9, so yeah, uh, you can run this yourself, and the thing is muted because I muted them by hand, it's not because of any auto-mute business, so this is, uh, let's put a high frequency here, that should do, let's increase the gain, and you wanted me to do 18, so I will do the, it's about 18, and this is the cramped version, as I move it up you can see it cramping, I'll let that be around here, where the cramping is very pronounced, then I will copy it over, change the type, and this time I don't want the automation because the null test would be crazy if I did that. But here is the peak, analog, decramped, same gain, same frequency, same cue, and both signals are going there. Now I just invert the polarity of one of them, and this is how you set up a null test. I will put a frequency analyzer, but I want this to be a stock one. So you don't have to install a thousand things to open this project. So this is the stock one. And this difference is more pronounced than I was expecting, actually. Did I do something wrong on the setup? ATDB of gain. Uh, no, sounds about right. Sounds about right. And in terms of integration, that will smooth things out a little bit. And we can also increase or play around with the FFT value. Yeah, this is nowhere near a null. But let's take a copy of the cramped version, route the white noise to that as well and mute this, so this is the uh, original, this is the tweaked Q, that's what I'm about to do, and this is the D cramped, because that's what it boils down to, right? When you have a uh, cramping, what you will natu naturally do by ear is adjust the Q, because you want to hear more or uh, more of that boost or that cut. But let's play around with the Q and try to get a better null. And usually you want to make the curve fatter for that null to be better. And the differences are significant. We are talking about like 30 dB, but they're concentrated at the top. And this is really where the cramping is most pronounced anyway, so I cannot null this very well. But I don't also don't want to repeat what Dan Warrow already did to exhaustion, so if you think that this isn't answering your question, then make sure to download the Reaper project at the end, and we may revisit this later. Uh, I, I think, hope we can hear it, but I am interested to see if we can or not. Yeah, I will not do listening tests because I think that they don't translate well on YouTube because YouTube does a low-pass filter on all the content and we are talking about high frequencies. I will make the project available so that every, everyone can hear this for themselves in their own setup. And also there are some Dan Warrow videos about this, I don't want to repeat myself. Um, man, Landry seriously killing it out here. Oh, thanks! I 
would say that Harrison people keep trying to make this discussion about whether or not it can be heard and all these things are on the margin, but the reality is their marketing is misleading and intentionally so, and they never admitted that. Uh, yeah, that, those are fair points. I admitted to my own biases in the beginning and I sort of expressed my political views about that. And I also think that I don't think people will hear this because they will compensate this for the queue anyway. They will compensate this by ear. I don't think it affects workflow. I think it really is like an academic pursuit. But yeah, the marketing, the politics, the communication with the customers, all of that is a nice discussion. I am going to the more nerdy topics today. Uh, and this comment is held for review. What the fuck, YouTube? Uh, pin message, add moderator, there you go. Now Aria doesn't have to go through that anymore. <laughs> uh, instead of owning up to it and even pointing out that everyone does it, they keep trying to place the blame on the customer like, ah, you idiots can even hear it. <laughs> Maybe it was because you used the word idiots. <laughs> yeah, I mean, companies have made mistakes before and owned up to it and ended up looking okay. I think it actually makes the brand stronger, not weaker, if we are going to take the tangent on politics again. But yeah, Bitwig had a whole backlash recently and they recovered well. I am not a Bitwig user, I haven't followed the drama closely, but it seems like they managed the situation pretty appropriately. So it is possible. At least for an outsider like me, when the thing came out, the initial drama came out, I was like, yeah, I'm probably not gonna even bother with Bitwig in the future because people seem to dislike it. I don't know, I'm already happy where I am. But when they made up to it, I'm like, yeah, maybe, maybe I may consider Bitwig in the future. They seem to be nice. If I make a spice mix and tell people it was it has saffron on it, and it doesn't, my best bet is to own that <laughs> instead of be like, ah, saffron is a subtle note anyway that no one can taste. <laughs> yeah, I feel like Harrison is in damage control mode, and due to the reputation of the analog console, they refuse to be humble about this situation and admit to any wrongdoings. But that's the weird thing, right? If you, uh, by the way, hi Percy. <laughs> Nice to have you here. I think it makes the brand stronger when you say, hey, yeah, hmm, that happened. We made this because of these reasons. It seems like you don't like it. Okay, we will try and make something different and everyone will be happier in the end. Uh, but most nice people can forgive mistakes easier than unchecked arrogance. It's not even about forgiveness, I think. It's not, I don't I don't see it that way. Um, I don't see it as forgiveness because it is like aware, to be honest, it also has to do with awareness because if it wasn't for this polemic and these videos, I wouldn't know about this plugin. So, hey, maybe if they come up with a new version, new communication, new, maybe the same plugin, just package it differently, they were able to put their plugin in front of more people. So that's nice. Anyway, we will get to the more technical stuff in a moment. Let's continue with this. Who, what do you mean by not admitting wrongdoing? Did you watch the interview? The sound of fireworks over the stream is hacking me off now. Is there a problem with this stream? Or are there fireworks near where you are? Is the stream okay? Have I been talking for half an hour without anyone hearing? Meters look good. God damn it, it always scares me when people say things like that. Uh, I did watch it when they did. When did they admit wrongdoings? If you send me a timestamp, I will go back and rewatch that. I suddenly pressed something and now I'm here. <laughs> you pressed the thumbnail for this video. That's what happened. Hello, Sewitz. Great to have you here. Percy, who says, what I saw was a lot of passive aggressiveness towards the end review. The only comment I will make, I made before and I will make again is, in, term, in terms of the attitude, not showing your face is not an argument. That's something that people say on the playground, not something that people say 
as a company. <laughs> and they, it was not the company who said. It was not the company who said. It was then from Lonnie Rocker who insisted on Dan showing his face. Which, by the way, he did. There is a video of Dan Warrow with a face review. It's just that it's him and his band So you, and, and from many years ago. So you don't know who exactly he is. But if I, I did this whole stream without the face cam, I think it would have the same value. I think that the things I am showing in terms of truths and trying to share the project so that it can reproduce the research and all of that stands on its own without me having the face cam. I just want to, you to be able to see me, but it's a personal matter. Anyway, your YN2 is equal to YN. Yeah, okay, that's what Martin also pointed out. Thanks. Our duty do. I don't get that. Not want to sidetrack the tech discussion, but Pedantically speaking, our only claim is that we implemented resistor and capacitor, which, as you say, is a valid comment. Yes, 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 yes. So I will say this again for people who are joining now. The claim that Dan Warhol keep, kept bringing up on his video and that is still on the Harrison Consult's website is that every component of the model of the hardware has been considered in the model. And strictly speaking, that's true. If you look at the console, look at the curves it produces and reproduce that curve somehow using digital analog, uh, sorry, digital equalizers, practically speaking, you considered every component because you ran audio through the thing to analyze it. You are sort of telling the truth. You are lying by telling the truth, as you, one could say. <laughs> You're sort of misleading by telling the truth. You can tell the truth in many ways. But yeah, I agree, I agree. Everything can be implemented in the model without necessarily cramping, decramping. That's a separate axis on the conversation, as far as I'm concerned. Best case study for this is how Justin Franco recreated, uh, reacted to Dan Warrow's videos saying their compressor has off ratios. Yes, or for people who don't know, Dan Warrow also reviewed some of the stock plugins in Reaper, found some problems, and the developers of Reaper, including Justin Frankel, but not limited to him, also uh, John Schwartz, Schwa, I'm not sure I know how to pronounce his next name, but yeah, they fixed, fixed some of the problems, and there are other problems that have not been fixed for various reasons, but the reaction was never adversarial. Justin admitted that it was a mistake on his part, and he was not as good as he is now when he wrote that thing, and that was that. That's class. I agree. People should read about this, because it is a very nice, nerdy topic as well. Uh, Frankel log 2. Is that kind of going to come up? Yes, that's the post. I will link to all of these things in the description when the stream is over, so make sure to check back. But yeah, this is the fix to the issue reported by Dan Moro. And this is how Justin Frankel in particular, but Reaper Caucus in general, after all, this is on the Caucus website. So this is how Caucus as a company answered to that situation. That's the way I saw it too. No, lol, the fireworks are outside mine. Okay, 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 okay. Headphones. Who you watched at the original, who of you, I guess? Or No, it's Percy Who, the name. You watched the original Dan video. Did you notice Dan did not even adjust the input settings or levels? This is a passive plugin test. Not sure I understand that. Streams still fine and fun, awesome. I'll say it again, my wording could have been chosen better, but my intent was sincere. Users should not expect any saturation in the plugin or DAW unless otherwise noticed. noted. Fair point. This is a whole other part of the conversation that has nothing to do with cramping. Should the plugin saturate or have any non-linearity? Should it not? Arguments can be made either way. Personally, I don't care. I, it's not nerdy for decrimped filters. That's going to be my topic today. But yeah. Um, and I think that one of the 
the peeves was that when you say this, you are implying that there is some saturation because the console will saturate because it cannot have infinite headroom because it's using resistors, capacitors, and transistors, and those are real things. <laughs> they are, they don't have infinite bandwidth. Sorry, uh, infinite headroom. So this sentence could imply some sort of nonlinearity, maybe, but. I'm fine with that not being the case. I think some plugins need their input drive increased to increase harmonics. Yeah, so gain is something that matters when you have distortion, nonlinearity, that sort of thing. For the kinds of filters that we are dealing with, gain does not matter. I could take my white noise and put it at 100 dB or at minus 2000 dB, it doesn't matter. And in Reaper, everything is 64 double floating point number. So the headroom is, you can practically think of it as infinite. It's not just above the hearing uh, capabilities, it's orders and orders or orders of magnitude beyond the hearing capability. So it doesn't matter. But yeah, uh, in our plugins, all the plugins we are looking at today, no harmonics, no distortion, no saturation, no problems with gain. I do apologize for the wording of my statement. Yeah, don't worry about it. Feel free to call the office or email to have a chat anytime. Yeah, I just want to make sure you got my email, right? I invited everyone to this call. I still have Skype open. So Nathan, then Waro, uh, anyone else, who is in this conversation, you can join right now. The link is in your inbox. If it's not, let me know in the chat. I will send the email again, but you can join and say whatever you want or need to say right now on the stream. It's The door is still open. Moving on, the stream is fine in Maxwell City. Awesome. Back to the tech discussion. I feel like we should be able to know the cramped with the non-cramped better. I feel that too. I don't know what I need to do. and. I f but I, that's my feeling. It should know better. And yeah, run the tests again and follow up and let me know. Because I, I, that's odd. I don't know. Maybe I need to change the cutoff frequency too? I don't know. Micah is here. Hello. It doesn't say they considered. He says it was included. Well... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> whatever, right? We all know what's going on. Um, I mean, we all know that if you change this from included to considered, I don't think it affects the conversation a whole lot. Uh, but I get your, I get your point. I was, I spent almost seven years of my life on a PhD on programming language theory. I can have a discussion about semantics for the rest of my life. <laughs> I love it. Anyway, this is more technical discussion and I can add to that. Okay, just a hunch, but can you try and send the white noise at minus 6 dB instead of unity? Aria, I think you mean on the send to lower this? But the white noise is already running at minus 12. It's not running at unity. But in any case, none of this should matter. Again, everything in this comparison today is linear. There is no saturation, no distortion, no harmonics anywhere. I don't know. I don't know exactly what you mean. But anyway, um, I guess it will be necessary to do a follow-up because all of you are going to download this project, run all your tests, and then we can do a follow-up where we have a big old discussion about everything that you found out. That would be lovely. Now let's test the plugin that we have implemented. I will collapse everything else. Just make sure that everything is muted. And we will load the plugin we developed, which is implementing the RBJ bandpass filter. Crossed fingers. Um, RBJ that and I also need to send my good old white noise to that track 
and something is happening to the audio. It is affecting the audio. Let's put the Burton EQ analyzer because the first test is not with the white noise. The first test is correctness. So we should see a band pass, and we do. First try, yeah! First try, you all. And it moves around. And it is a band pass, honest to goodness. It does get narrower, it does get larger. And it moves around and it cramps. It cramps like there is no tomorrow. We did it. In terms of latency, Uh, I wanted to say I, I'm not going to do that test because we know we didn't introduce any latency, but what the hell, let's do the test anyway. We all know what's going to come out of it, but let's do the test for completeness. Latency. Is there a latency that my plugin is not declaring? <laughs> is there? <laughs> I have a tone that is a sine wave, and it so happens that my bandpass is not covering that frequency, so it almost goes to mush. But here is the little spike. Here is that little spike. They're lined up. You can do this test more properly at home. We know what we did. We didn't introduce any latency. Whatever. Next, we will do the, cramp the decramped filter test that for correctness, and for the grand finale, we will do the performance test reproducing what we learned from, or maybe not reproducing what we learned from, the Melda EQ. But really, the whole conversation we are having today was more or less an excuse for me to implement the decramped filters, because that was a rabbit hole of mine for a long time. I wanted to learn more about this, the elusive decramped filters, because I saw the RBJ there all over the internet. But the decramped versions seemed like a holy grail for me for some time, because I couldn't find it out, and everything that I could find out was super complicated. And I couldn't make my make much sense out of it. And everything unlocked when I read this book, Designing Audio Effect Plugins in C++ by Will Perkle. He has a great introduction on digital signal processing. Yeah, it sells itself as a C++ book, but for me, the best part was the digital signal processing, not the C++ in there. Though the C++ part is good, it's just that my preferred part was the digital signal processing, and he has an explanation of how to do this decramped filters, and that was amazing, and that's how I got to learn about Martin Vikanik. Am I pronouncing your name right? Let me know in the Skype conversation if I am connect sorry <laughs> but that's how I learned about his filters they are right here this is the paper cited in this book they also uh, will also implement some of it I think maybe misremembering but he cites this paper and I went back to the source and that's what we are going to look at today and then I learned that it's not too hard to find out because if you go to the Wikipedia page for digital filters particularly the biquets which is the technical term for the kind of filter that we are implementing. The RBJ is a biquet, and this formula sort of looks like the formula that we implemented here. Oh, and I forgot to do something for performance reasons, so we will have to retest the correctness because I will fix something about this implementation before we move on. But anyway, this formula sort of looks like the formula that we have here. So this is a biquad. But anyway, at the end of the Wikipedia article, here is the Vikanek. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing the Vikanek paper yet again. How to do the matched filters that I explained one hour ago. The, the theory, the, the whole theory of adapting the analog filter before digitizing it. So you take the ideal analog filter, you tweak it, a little, tweak it a little bit, and then digitize that. As far as I understand, that's the approach taken by not only, but also by Martin Vikanek on this plugin. And that's the person who is on the Skype call right now. Isn't that amazing? I find that remarkable. So two ways you can find this filter. It is 
out there. It's on the Wikipedia article. <laughs> it is on very well-known books, so it's not very well hidden. It's just that it took me a while to find and uh, actually get the background necessary to understand all this. Right, so let's get to this, but before let's implement the optimization, because we are multiplying by a constant. Remember I said this is a linear filter. Notice how we are adding things and subtracting, but subtraction, what is subtraction if not addition by a negative number, right? So we are adding and subtracting and we are multiplying by constants. These are constants computed here. They never change in the sample section. We never multiply const, uh, sorry, we never multiply samples. If we did this, that would be nonlinear. If we did that, it would be nonlinear. If we did this, it would be nonlinear. But we are not doing any of that. This is all linear. We are multiplying by constants. We are adding things up and that's that. But notice how these are constants and we keep dividing by a zero. That's silly because zero, a zero doesn't change. So this division is happening over and over, which will slow things down. And we don't have to have that, right? So here is a trick that almost everyone does when they're implementing this. They take all the coefficients, except for a zero, because notice that every coefficient will be divided by a zero. That division happens everywhere. So you just take all the coefficients that are not a zero and divide by a zero before you try to compute any samples. So now we don't have to divide again because we have already divided by a zero. We have scaled or normalized all the coefficients like that. So this change makes everything faster because we are doing fewer operations. We are no longer doing that division, but it doesn't change the outcome. It doesn't change the result. It doesn't change the curves on the filter. And I will prove that to you by coming back to the project where we do the JS effects thing. And I will reload the plugin from scratch. And I will also put the good old Burton EQ curve analyzer, RBJ. And there you have good old band. It moves around, it cramps, it gets thinner and thicker, same result. I will not test the latency again, I will let that to you, but we know we have not introduced latency. We have introduced phase changes, by the way, right? Which is sort of latency at the frequency level, but we haven't introduced latency. Because it's not latency at the frequency level, it's delay at the frequency level. Anyhow, here is the filter. It is still working and now it is performing ever so slightly better. Now we can move on to implement uh, uh, VConnect filters. I will call this VConnect. And this time I will try to make the paper show up on the side. So this is a great read. You do need a lot of technical background to be able to understand this conversation on this paper. I suggest yet again, the DSP guide, it should be enough. If not, maybe this book as well. I read both before I got here. So that's how I was able to follow this conversation. But yeah, again, it's kind of written for the initiated. I mean, it's introducing novel techniques in 17 pages and it's pretty complete in terms of analysis. So um, there is only so much you can fit on the paper, right? So you need some background to understand this, but it's a biquet all the same. The structure of the filter is pretty similar. And this time I don't think we can simply copy and paste. Oh, we can straight from the, no, we cannot. This minus signs, for instance, come up wrong in plain text. So we will re rewrite this by hand. So on the sample section, we will need to do the biquad thing, which if you look, it's pretty similar, right? B0, Xn, B1, Xn minus one, B2, Xn minus two. In fact, it's so similar that we might just copy and paste this, change the Ys to use, I do want to follow the terminology from the paper, so I will change the Ys to letter use, so people reading the two side by side will 
follow the thread. And let's double check that I didn't misplace any signs, any silly mistakes. Okay. And then in terms of the bookkeeping, it will be pretty similar. I guess I will copy this and that. And then I will take this formula, plop it there in the middle. All my x's are already correct, and x in this case is also the input, so that's okay. But my y's are now used. And now we are missing the coefficients. So note how the body of the two sample sections apart from the variable renaming is exactly the same. It does not matter if your filter is cramped or decramped unless you are modulating some of the parameters because then you have to recompute the coefficients. But the audio processing is exactly the same if your filter is static. Let's go to the... Let's borrow some of these things, actually. The sliders can be the same. And in the uh, slider section, we will have to compute the coefficients. Like that. And then we want to do a band pass. I will let you all read the paper with the time it deserves. I'm going to skip ahead and go to the parts of interest. There are two derivations of the decramped filters. So, for, for instance, here's one of them. And this on the right is the RBJ filters, I think. Yeah, bilinear transform. So that's the RBJ filters that we implemented, the bilinear transform. It's cramping. And here is the decramped version introduced in this paper. And this is the first implementation, the first, not implementation, the first description. But then there is the even simpler fits, which are more performant. They are better in terms of CPU. They are a bit worse in terms of the response curve. Not that it cramps, but the phase distortions will be a little more drastic. I think that the phase distortions will be a little more drastic. I may be wrong. But it, it goes a little more out of its way with respect to the analog ideal curves. But it is more efficient in terms of computation. So that's the one we are going to implement. And there are formulas for high pass, low pass, but we will do band pass this time. And yeah, again, this is kind of like the explanation of how the analog response curve was tweaked before digitization before the Z-transform. So the bandpass uh, will have a single zero, and I guess this is a zero in terms of zeros and poles. I did not explain that, so go read the DSP guide to understand what a zero and a pole is. But it will match the slope at DC. So you can see that at DC at zero hertz, not all the band passes are at zero. I mean, some of them are above zero. Some of them are below zero. I mean, if you project this further, it will go below zero. So, sorry, I'm not saying the right thing. I'm not. I'm not thinking about the the right thing here. I'm not. I, I don't want to say the value zero. What I want to say is the slope. That's the. That's a different thing. Sorry. I will try that again. At DC, at zero hertz, the slope is this, this well, this slope of this curve. It will go narrower, it will go steeper or less steep depending on the Q. Sorry, I will try that again because this explanation was crap. The way that the analog curve was tweaked before the Z transform, before the digit digitization of the or maybe not even the Z-transform, it's just a completely different approach to digitizing this. So, there was the original analog filter, it was converted into a digital filter, but before it was tweaked, and the tweaks were fixing, were putting some posts on the ground, so that we can have the response we want. And one of the posts was this zero at 
zero hertz. Another post was the slope at this point. So the slope here was more or less steep depending on the Q. So that that was another of the one on, another one of the posts on the ground. And uh, matching the magnitude at Nyquist. So at half of the sampling range, this point here, how high is it on this graph? Is it at a minus 20 dB or is it at minus 35 dB? And that was another point that is fixed. You put the, the post there and then everything in between these posts will wiggle a little bit. And you want this wiggle to perform well, to look good to look like the shape it's supposed to, but it will wiggle a little bit. And that's what we talk about when we say simpler fits or better fits, more precise fits. How well does it fit the analog curve when it wiggles a little bit after you fix these posts and you let everything in between wiggle a little bit? I'm hand-waving a lot on this explanation of how the matched filters come to be because I want this to be approachable. But the mathematics is all here, so you can reproduce these results. Anyway, the band pass. The solution is this. All right, this is the solution. How do I get B1? I guess let's go from the bottom up. So how do I get B2? I guess B2 is going to be the last thing we compute. So let's put it there. It's minus B0 minus B1. Easy enough. Minus B0 minus B1. Looking good. How do we get B2? zero that's the next thing we are going to compute how do we get b0 okay that's easy you just take r0 minus b1 r0 minus b1 divided by 2 r0 minus b1 divided by 2 how do we get b1 that's minus r1 divided by 2 okay but we introduced some things we don't know about okay let's put them there what are r0 and r1 they are defined right above I guess this equal columns means definition, right? It's not equality by computation or uh, by... I guess it's not the, the definition... Sorry, it's not equality, it's definition. R0 is by definition this, and R1 is by definition that. And we have two options. We can go with either this formula or that formula, but i think that in this case since we don't have b0 and b2 at this point that would be computed below uh, it makes more sense for me to use this formula so that's what we're going to use r0 and r1 in this order because r1 appears below and the order here is important because in many cases one thing is computed in a line and used on the next one so if you reverse these two lines you get the wrong equation Right, so R0 and R1. R1 is open parens, divide open parens, open parens, multiply, divide, 1 minus A1 plus A2. A1 and A2 we have seen before, so that's good indication that we are making progress. The more variables that we don't know of that we introduce, the worst. And then F0, oh, that's, an, that's one we don't know, so let's put it there for later. Divided by Q. And then on the denominator, we have a square root of something plus something divided by something. One minus the square of F0. Oh, and all of that is squared. So we get that. And it's starting to wrap into a new line. Let's do this. Plus, and this is the square of F0 divided by the square of capital Q. Let's review that. 1 minus A1 plus A2. All of that multiplied by F0 divided by Q. All of that divided by the square root of a bunch of things. The first thing is a square root. Sorry, a square of 1 minus the square of F0 
plus f0 squared divided by q squared. Looks right to me. B, sorry, uh, r0. That's easier. It's not easy, but it's easier. And that is 1 plus a1 plus a2 divided by pi times f0 times q. Review time. Do you see a mistake? That's when I need the chat. I need all the help I can, I can get. <laughs> okay. Although all of that looks correct to me, please point out any mistakes. So before we get to um, F0, because Q, we get it from there. That's easy. But F0 is not as easy. Here's how this works. Actually, I searched for F0, and maybe Martin is going to point out on the chat something that I... A misunderstanding but what I did is I tried to search for the definition of f0 and it's not really defined anywhere I could find so I think it's one of those terms of art that you are just supposed to know what it is and from having read Dale's implementation of this paper as well as from these figures I got a tentative answer so check this out there is no like f0 is this or that but if you look at the picture it is saying that the red is at f0 this number, yellow is at the f0 that number, and blue is by f0 point h. Now, this x-axis is frequency, and it is very suspicious that it stops here. It seems like it's running at 44.1 or 48 kilohertz, and then the Nyquist frequency is around it. 20 kilohertz, which makes sense, the audible range. So it seems to me as though, because the blue is f0.8, it seems to me as though this is 80% of the way to Nyquist frequency. So f0 is how close are you to the Nyquist frequency? In other words, um, I want 0 to 20 kilohertz, or I guess I should say Nyquist, I want that to go from 0 to 1. I want this f0 to be the normalized frequency. And that makes sense, because these equations should work just the same if your project is running at 48 kilohertz, 96 kilohertz, 192 kilohertz, it doesn't matter. The equations should be the same. So F0 should not be just frequency, because that is given to me in hertz, hertz. F0 should be normalized. I think that that's what this is about. So, what is Nyquist? We know that that's the sample rate divided by 2, and that's how you write that in JS effects. And then we can just say that um, take your frequency, which is given in this range of hertz, And I want to say divide that by... And I'm never sure about this part, but let me tr check this experimentally for a moment. If the frequency is 24, the Nyquist frequency, we get 24 kilohertz divided by 48, my sampling rate, 48 kilohertz divided by 2, which is 24 kilohertz. So 24 kilohertz divided by 24 kilohertz gives me 1. And 0 divided by whatever will give me 0. So now f0 should be a number between 0 and 1 as the frequency goes from 0 up to the Nyquist frequency. I think we achieved our goal. There is a bit of a waste of computation here because we are doing a division and then another division. And divisions are more expensive than multiplications. So what we can do is just rewrite this real quick like so. Let me prove that this two works. Frequency of 24 kilohertz divided by 24 kilohertz should be 1 divided by 48,000 multiplied by 2 is 1. 
and if the frequency was zero, it's zero. So everything still checks out, and now this is a bit faster. We are doing things for performance. Sorry to be a pain, but closing parenthesis is missing in R1 equal. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Closing parenthesis is missing. Let's go over R1 again. R1. It is here. So this parenthesis is the numerator. And that is closing there. This parenthesis is that parenthesis. And that is closing there. Then on the, the I think Martin is telling me the answer, but I'm gonna run through the thing again. So this parenthesis is the square root. It ends there. This parenthesis is this square, which is the one that's missing. Thank you. This mistake, I think that the JSFX compiler would catch. As soon as I tried to load the plugin in Reaper, it would say missing parentheses or something to that effect. But thanks, thanks. I really appreciate that. And now everything seems to be matching. So yeah, denominator, awesome. Thank you. Okay, so F0, we got. Now we need to find A1 and A2. It turns out that in the RBJ cookbook, the A's are different and have to be recomputed for each type of band, at least in the way that it is presented in the cookbook. The formulas for A's are always different. So you see, um, hang on. Are they all the same? Never noticed. I am such a dumb person. I always copy these lines over and over and over. These are all the same? I am the dumbest person alive. No, the A's are not all the same. Okay. For different types of curves, the A's are different. But it turns out, and, and, and perhaps that's because th that's the reason why uh, Robert Bristol Johnson repeated uh, this over and over because it changes on some and because it is convenient to be able to copy and paste like I did when I was implementing. But that's not what Vconnect did on his paper. Because the A's are all the same, he gave us the answer for the B's down here, but the, a the answers for the A's are way above in the paper. So we'll scroll all the way up to find our A's. And I guess I can do this by search, because it happens that search on PDFs actually works. Isn't that crazy? That's not it. I think I missed it. I think I, I, I went over it. Or maybe my search isn't working very well. Or maybe I have a space. I have a space there, don't I? Okay, now I should get more results. There you go. That's where I'm, I was looking for. Or maybe it isn't, because this is talking about the bilinear transform. This is talking about the RBJ cookbook. Ah, we got it. Those are the equations. I remember what they look like. So impulse invariance is the, yes, the, the formal name, the fancy term for the technique I explained before about putting some land posts on the curve and then letting everything in between wiggle because there is just only so many degrees of freedom you can have on a bike ride. Anyway, that's the name of this technique. So you don't want the bilinear transformer A1, you want the impulse invariance A1 and A2. They are there. And we are here. We are looking for A1 and A2 and we have it. So there are, again, two options, but then this option has all the Z's in there, and I don't want to get into that. Let's go with this option on the right, though it does look a bit scarier, but it is going to end up being easier in the end. So this is e to the power of minus 2 times q times W0. Again, see how I'm, I, I, in the cookbook it was W0, but in many places it's actually omega. The cookbook was written in plain text, but when you're writing things in mathematical typesetting, you use omega 
zero for the angular frequency. But I'm going to use W because it's the closest character I have. So two times Q times omega zero. That was easy. But there is a gotcha. Ha ha. This Q is not a capital Q. It's a lowercase Q. It's not the same Q. It's not the same Q, you all. Pay attention to that. It's not the same Q, and that will throw you off, particularly because in JSFX, variables are case insensitive. So the way that this is written, this Q and this Q is the same, but in the paper, it's not. So what we are going to do is put a Q underscore to differentiate, and then we need to find a Q definition somewhere in the paper. This will, this will mess you up if you're doing this and not paying attention. Next, for A1, this is actually um, one equation in two parts, depending on the Q. And this is, again, lowercase Q, not capital Q. Not the Q you would control on the user interface. It's a different Q. So for A1, we are going to check our Q underscore to see if it is less than or equal to 1. If so, we will have the first formula. If not, we will have the second formula. It is superfluous to test for Q greater than 1 because these two conditions are mutually exclusive and testing for this would be a bit more CPU, so we will do this instead and let the else case be the one below. And then we will have two equations. The first equation on the top is minus 2 times the exponential, times e to the power of... Hey, they, that looks similar. Let's copy and paste. Save ourselves some typing. It is just minus q, lowercase q, times omega zero. Good. Times the cosine of the multiplication of the square root of one minus the square of q lowercase q, and then the parentheses that I missed below, I'm not going to miss now. I learned from the mistakes. This looks about right, and the second equation is suspiciously similar, so I will copy and paste, but I will change it. So the first part is all the same, but here is a cosine that is hyperbolic, and here the terms are inverted. So I'll take the square root and bloop, and take the minus one and bloop, and then we need to implement the cosine. <laughs> okay, on the init section, we can implement cosine hyperbolic. Why? Because cosine is a primitive in JS effects. But cosine hyperbolic is not a primitive in JS effects. We have to implement this ourselves. So cosine hyperbolic of x, we'll get to that later. I will put some underscores on the parts that we are missing, because otherwise I will probably lose track. But anyway, we have a1, and it looks about right. Let's get to q underscore and try to find that good old lowercase q. So I'm going to go to the top of the article and search for q. <laughs> Only 179 matches. It's going to be quick. Could probably look for q space or something. q equals sign. There you go. So lowercase q is this. And this definition is on the bilinear transform, but it's never revisited. If you check all the rest of the paper, it's never revisiting the definition of lowercase q. So this is the definition we want. 1 divided by 2 times capital Q, which is the slider. Now we are missing W0 or omega 0. And we are missing the cosine hyperbolic. Let's go to the hyperbolic functions Wikipedia article and borrow from there real quick. So the cosine hyperbolic is one of these we can choose. There are several ways of defining this. So we can choose any of these three. Let's see which appears to be the fewer computations. So this has two exponentials, this has two exponentials, this has two exponentials. It's a wash. All of them have divisions. All of them have additions. That's a wash. So let's avoid the formulas that have a two 
times here, a, two, a, a multiplication on the exponent, because that's more a computation. So let's go with the first formula. So cosine hyperbolic of x is a division of x x plus x minus x. Don't scream at your wind at your computer yet. I remembered the parentheses. All right, mm. cosine of x uh, uh, uh. looks right to me. And then w zero. Well, omega zero. Again, I think this is one of those terms of art. You are sort of expected to know what W0 or omega zero is because it is used everywhere. It is in, even used on the bilinear transformer, on the RBJ cookbook. So it is the, the angular frequency, I think, is the term for this. It goes between minus pi and pi. It represents the frequency spectrum not between um, 20, what am I doing? Not between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz, not between 0 and 1. It represents the spectrum between 0 and 2 pi, or minus pi and pi, however you want to think about it. But yeah, it goes from uh, uh, the trigonometric circle. And that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Representing frequencies on a, tri a trigonometric circle? Hey. Everything's starting to connect, isn't it? But anyway, uh, omega zero is something that we can actually borrow from the RBJ equation. So we can come here and take that. Poof. And here the terminology is different. Hey, this F zero, you may be tempted to use it, but no, in the RBJ cookbook, F zero is the frequency that was defined in the cookbook. F zero was the frequency, not normalized. But in the Vconnect paper, F0 is normalized. So hey, don't use that. F0, use frequency here. And instead of Fs, that we just essentially renamed the sample rate to Fs to match the paper. But in this case, we can go ahead and just put S rate there, the sampling rate. And then we have W0. Nothing is missing. Except for the, any mistakes I made, this is an, an implementation of the paper. Um, I will go to the chat now, read what you all have to say, and then we'll come back and test this. Starting with Martin, because he knows it all. Okay, and then you two. Where are you, people? You are here. Nope, oh, nope, you are here. Um, okay, so yeah, I did that, but maybe you have a follow-up to that. It cramps like there is no tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks so much for this stream. It was, it was so interesting. Is it over? <laughs> it is interesting. <laughs> I'll do my homework about boosting and cutting. I still can't believe we are living in this moment where someone with uh, your experience just hits stream and shares so much. Thanks so much, really. Thank you. Thank you for watching and thank you for saying that. It's very nice of you. Isn't he always the creator, also the creator of Pure Data and the original guy from Max? Maybe. Maybe. I don't know who created Pure Data. Who is the creator of Pure, Pure Data? I, uh, no, that, that name doesn't ring a bell. The phase is because we are introducing a two-sample delay, right? Yeah. The way that we are filtering is by taking previous samples as well as previous outputs of our own filter and multiplying by constants and adding. So. We are sort of doing a delay of one sample and then a delay of two samples and a couple of uh, samples of feedback on the delay. Very short delays, very uh, recursive delays. There is a bit of feedback and the, if you think about this, the plus is mixing stuff together. So we are playing our sample and our previous samples and we are replaying some of the feedback and we are 
weighting, we are multiplying by constants, which is just a volume knob. So the way that a digital filter with this implementation works is by doing a filter, sorry, by doing a delay, very short, couple of samples, a bit of feedback, but very well-tuned volume, <laughs> very well-tuned volume. Finding the volume of the previous samples, finding the volume you would put on the feedback, that's where it's at. That is what warrants a lot of mathematics, that's what gets you papers, that's what gets you money. <laughs> it's computing that volume, but yeah, you are right. And because we are doing this delay, there is a bit of phase issue because you are sort of delaying some frequencies more than others and you are weighting all this based on these coefficients. How come in slider section and not in the init section? How come in slider section and not in the init section? Because the coefficients are going to change based on the uh, user inputs, based on the parameters. And what's a little wiggle between friends? Am I right? F0 is the center frequency, it's the cutoff frequency, yeah. Yeah, note the closing bracket after square root of F0. Are you pointing out the same problem I noticed that Martin noticed? Or no, because this is a different formula, so I am missing something? Let's let's count. One, two, one, zero. Checks out. One, two, three, two, one, two, one, two. One, zero, all checks out, I think I'm good. Message automatically held for review, hidden by IDDQD sound. If you if you hit it, I trust you, you are a moderator now. Shouldn't it be S rate times half now? Shouldn't it be times half now? Oh, you were probably commenting on this transformation, but no, what happened was I had something that looks like this and I transformed that into something that looks like that. And plug in some numbers and you will see that it checks out. One and a half. One and a half. I think that that's what you were commenting on. I will let you sort this out on paper, that's how I do it. But I think that that's, I think that that's the, the question. Yes, I think it should. So maybe I am wrong. What am I? When I, what am I missing? What am I making uh, that is incorrect? Let me know. That was my assumption also. So everyone seems to agree I am wrong. Oh, I already fixed it. Okay. I already fixed Oh, you, no, but uh, you already fixed it was about this comment. And I checked it out. But this comment is still pending. So if I am making a mistake, because you get Nyquist by dividing sample rate by two. Yeah, but all of that is in parentheses. Work out the parentheses like I did and you will, you'll see for yourself. I think it's me against three people. <laughs> I think I'm right. But yeah, we'll, we'll see. The, the Burton EQ analyzer will not lie to us. Let's load this in Reaper. Enough talking, enough talking. This is going to be the track for two instances of Burton EQ Analyzer. And then Vikanek in the middle. But not that one. Scan for new plugins. That. Oh no. Slider at line 17. Mm. Missing parentheses. All right. It was bound to happen. I was being too lucky so far. Uh, I am looking at the equation for A1, which is on this section about here. And I don't want the, all these highlights. If Q underscore is less than or equal to one, 
to x exp that that checks out cosine Oh, that one. Last sanity check. Looks right. Let's see what Reaper has to say. Boop. Hey, it compiles. And it is changing the audio. And it is a freaking band pass. Ha! Would you look at that? Now the question is, does it cramp? It does not. It does not cramp. And that's how you implement a filter that is not cramped. Not that hard, is it? Oh, that's lovely. Now let's look at this carefully. Because you cannot have your cake and eat it too. Let's look at the phase response. I said that the phase response would be a bit wacky. So let's put a frequency that we know, like 10,000, or 10,000, like that. And the shift at 10,000 was supposed to be zero. But at 10,000, we read 12 degrees. Look at the, I cannot point you, uh, yes, look at this little box when I put my cursor there. So see, 13 degrees in, yeah. The phase response here is not zero. Compare that to the RBJ filter, where I put the RBJ frequency at 10, 1, 2, 3, 10,000. And then I look at the phase response. And the phase response is, is max zero degrees at 10 kilohertz. So you cannot have your cake and eat it too, but that's not all. As I move the filter up, check what happens to the very top of the curve, it is sitting at 0 dB line, which is the correct thing, but as I move it up, it does not cramp, but it does go down a little bit. By how much? When we have the filter all the way up, it went down by half a dB. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. We fixed the slope at 0 Hz, we fixed the a zero at zero hertz, I think, and we fixed the gain at Nyquist, but we did not fix the gain at the cutoff frequency. So that one is allowed to wiggle a bit, and so it wiggled a bit. That's the price you pay. You only have so many degrees of freedom in a bike wedge. Something got, it's got to give, but the art in the filter design space is to find good trade-offs, and as far as I'm concerned, it is a very good trade-off. There are other people who apply a similar technique and some of them are even discussed on this very paper, like the Orphanides and the Masberg filter curves. Sort of similar style, similar approach, but there are some trade-offs made by these other curves that are less advantageous and that's why the Vikanak is my favorite. Because, for instance, on the Orphanides derivation, your, uh, your cutoff frequency, your center frequency, has to be half a bandwidth below the Nyquist frequency, which means in, in that derivation, if you try to go above 10, sorry, not above 10k, about 11k, because it's a half of Nyquist. My sampling rate is 48, my Nyquist is 24, so anything above 12k and the filter breaks. Not so good of a trade-off in my opinion. In the case of the Vikanek filter, yeah, it goes a little bit down in terms of gain, but in practical terms, who, know, who cares? They will just increase the gain if they think that the gain needs to be increased. Every EQ will have a gain knob. By ear, you tune this out and you'll probably not hear it in the first place. Half of dB at this frequency probably will not make a difference, but it's a pretty good trade-off and it is stable. And according to the paper, you can even automate this at very fast speeds, which is something you may need to do if you're doing some kind of synthesizers, for instance, or a wacky kind of audio effect. 
you can do that, and the filter will hold up. Good stuff. So, yeah, now we have the implementations are working. Again, I will skip the latency test because we implemented this using the same technique as the other one. The, the sample section is exactly the same as I pointed out, so we know we are not introducing latency. Let's skip this part. We have been here for so long. But anyway, it is correct. It is lovely. Let's do the performance test. Um, you just made a plugin, pretty cool. I made two. <laughs> I made two plugins. What are you talking about? Yay, success. Bravo. Thank you. Checking the math, F0 equals frequency divided by sample rate times 2. See if the curve does the same on the Melda equalizer. I want to do that. I want to do that. Let's take a good track here. Put the Burton EQ analyzer. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my VConnect plugin, but I will wire it in such a way that it's only affecting the first channel. And Burton is stereo, so it will show in dark green our filter, and in light cyan, green, blue, I'll let you decide. I will put Melda. Oh, no, 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 that doesn't make sense. Melda only implements a decrimped peak. I think that the Melda equalizer bandpass is cramped. But we'll check it out anyway. So I'll turn this into a band. And I will move it around. Yeah, cramped. Yeah, this test doesn't make sense. The only band that we have that is decramped is the peak. Peak analog. All the other shapes are cramped. For instance, high shelf, let's see. Or maybe low sh uh, Yeah, high shelf. Let's see, high shelf. Yeah, it is a bit subtle, especially when there is the spectro analyzer. But yeah, you can see it cramping as I move it up. Yeah, and all the equalizer only has peaking, only has uh, the bell that is decramped. And we implemented bandpass. It so happens that on this paper, the fast versions, because remember I said there are two derivations. There is the more precise first, that showcases the theory better, probably. And then uh, there is the even simpler fits. The even simpler are um, the one you would want to use, right? It is the, the one that is faster. And in this paper, there is only low pass, high pass, band pass. So that's why I chose band pass to begin with. Haha. -ha! I prepared for this one. I have a freaking list of bullets. <laughs> okay, so I did what you wanted me to try. Frequency 24 kilohertz as rate is 48k. Okay, I'm not sure I understand that. It works because the divide happens first. Ah, gotcha. I remember it was it as multiplication goes first. Hang on, let's see what happens on this line. We already proved that it's right, because the curves are right, but anyway, we will beat this one to death. Yeah, the order doesn't matter, okay? If I do this, it works just the same. Just pointing this out. In mathematics, perhaps this would be uh, written differently, but in programming languages, I haven't checked JS effects, and JS effects has a weird quirk about AND and OR that is different from every other programming language. The precedence of these operators is the same, in JS effects, and usually this binds tighter than that in every other programming language, so that the conjunctive normal form doesn't need parentheses. Hey, that's a mouthful. Anyway, so in JS effects, I suppose that it is the same as every other programming language in which division and multiplication have the same operator precedence, so writing it like this is the same as writing it like that. All right, anyway. What was, what was I saying again? <laughs> so it is frequency divided by S rate times 2. 
Okay, divide and multiply are equal precedence, so it's left to right. <laughs> Just seeing saying the same thing I said. To me, this trade-off really shouldn't matter when I'm mixing, but I will very rarely boost the frequency at 20k, so staying within reasonable ranges makes much more sense in my opinion. Oh yeah, uh, you are probably talking about the trade-offs in the different derivations, but I agree. I agree, practically speaking. I will say this again, in the end, you are probably not going to hear any of this cramped or not cramped, but especially because you can tune the differences by year anyway. But I would say that if I was to implement an equalizer, I would probably not like to restrict people to say like, hey, you cannot go above a certain frequency. I guess it would annoy some people if they couldn't do that. But yeah, practically speaking, Sure. Okay, I need this in my plugins. Go ahead and pick it up. It is on Martin's website. Can I can I can I mention you by first name, Martin? I hope I can. If you have clients that can hear half a dB, let them do the mix. <laughs> um, if you have clients that can hear cramping, then just go ahead and give them a Grammy for having magical ears. <laughs> yes. And Aaron is here. Hey, I got your email. I will reply soon. Hopefully in the future we will have Aaron over to talk about analog a whole lot more and we will actually do analog circuits. We will actually solder stuff together or at least design things together and then I will solder stuff on my own. But we will do those things and then we can try and digitize things and see how they compare. It will be a lot of fun. John says, if I use the brute force down oversampling approach. Downside is the oversampling, yes? This will be the trade-off, not the wiggle. Correct. If you do oversampling, there is no wiggle. There is no, uh, this should be at 0 dB, but it is act actually at minus half dB. There is no um, phase response that is a bit off. Instead of 0 degrees, it's a, a little uh, off at the cutoff frequency, none of that, none of that. Oversampling uh, fixes all of those issues at the cost of latency and CPU. So overall, I would say probably the trade-off is in favor of the decrampt filters to begin with. And that's what most plugins are doing these days, like fab filter, decrampt EQs, I don't know if it's VConnect, it's probably, probably isn't, but decrampt filters, no oversampling. And I think that the tone boosters is doing the same. Uh, Melda is probably doing the same because we saw there was no latency. Anyway, at my age, I can only hear up to 13k anyway, so not much chance of hearing cramping. The point is that you can hear a difference if fed the same isolated audio to a filter that cramps and one that doesn't. The cramping isn't just about super high frequencies, it changes the shape of the filter. Yes, it does change the shape of the filter at high frequencies, but for the frequencies that you would care about more, you can compensate with the Q and so on and so forth. Okay, I, I think I was doing some demonstrations and cutting and pacing and changing things around. So for the last time, I will make sure that this is saved. That's saved. I will remove everything and do it once over because I want to make sh absolutely sure I did not like make a silly little mistake when telling people that you can put this this times two on the other side of the division and then I copy and paste something wrong or whatever. So Burton EQ Curve Analyzer, RBJ, and cramping, but otherwise correct. Oh, and by the way, that's another thing you could say about the RBJ filters. They cramp, but they don't change the gain. And even the phase response is right. So if that's what you care about, go RBJ. Now, VConnect. No cramping. And I guess I should point this out. I did not notice all of these things myself, okay? The paper is awesome. You should all read it. 
but the paper includes a graph showing the response curves at different frequencies. So there you can see the gain going down, for instance. That's how I realized that the gain was going down, and that's why I could point it out. Anyway, um, seems like everything is in place, everything is still functioning. So with that, let's get to the grand finale. We will put as many instances as necessary to make significant CPU use on the RBJ filters, modulating the frequency, feeding some white noise through it. We will do the same to the VKNEC. We will look at the CPU use and we will see whether um, you can claim that you made your filter scrimp because of CPU use. At least in this very specific scenario, I know the world is a big place, there are different trade-offs, there are different reasons to do dif different things, different ways. Let's not get into the politics again. I'm just saying we will have proven something about these particular approaches that I am using, about these particular tests that I am making, and you can make of that what you want. White noise is being fed to the tracks. RBJ is on the first track. VKNAC is on the second track. I will modulate this frequency. And the modulation here is not the same as the modulation on the Melda production plugin, okay? Because here I'm modulating the frequency on a linear scale and there I was modulating the frequency on a logarithmic scale. But that's not a problem because I'm going to be consistent and modulate the frequency on a logarithmic scale in both plugins. But I'm just pointing this out because it's not exactly the same comparison. When you compare Melda to our plugins, it's an apples to oranges comparison. When we compare these two plugins in front of us, it's an apples to apples comparison. And um, yeah, all that matters is that the modulation on this is the same in both plugins. But because this is linear, it will change at a different rate and the coefficients could be computed at a different rate when compared to a logarithmic change. It could be the case. I'm not sure if it is the case, but it's something to be aware of. But anyway, it is modulating the frequency like I needed. And oh, this is a bandpass, so I don't have to worry about auto-muting because it will not increase the volume of the signal. If, only, if anything, it's going to decrease the volume of the signal. So I take this band, sorry, this parameter, modulation, LFO, and they're both moving. They're mo not moving in sync, but that should not matter. So now we take this and we start making clones. Two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64 have 64 instances of this. This time I had to get a couple more instances to get some significant use because I wanted something above 1% because otherwise it's too noisy. And I wanted to have something above 1%. So I had 64 instances. And of course, this is JS effects. This is, on the one hand, it's JS effects, which is slower than C++, but Melda has the whole interface and everything. That must slow things down. And on the VKNAC, I have 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. Another thing to point out is that my machine is under heavy load. I am streaming to YouTube, I am running OBS, I am run, I'm, I'm on a Skype call. Lots of stuff happening. That influences tests. So maybe you want to run this test at home to see if it makes a difference in your controlled environment, in your processor, in your machine. But here on my machine, these numbers are not significantly different. So the claim that you have to, de you have to use cramped filters for performance doesn't seem to hold very well. As far as I'm concerned, this myth is busted. Um, uh, 
There is an argument to be made that you shouldn't be using bell filters at high frequencies, and a high shelf is what you would really want. True. Hang on, I feel like I'm missing some of the conversation, but I also want to double check something. I want to double check that all the parameters are being modulated, not just the first one. Yes, when I duplicate the plugins, the parameter modulation comes with, because that would invalidate the whole test setup. Here's my script. I feel like I missed some of the conversation. Yeah, okay. But uh, Jesse is right. You usually want high shelves, not few, uh, not bells. But I should also point that the high shelf will cramp as well. All the shapes will cramp. Even the low pass filter, the high pass filter, the notch, all of them uh, go out of shape on the RBJ filter. Aria says, exactly. I don't have magical ears. I can't find, uh, I can't hear flies flicking, but a curve changing to be sounding different when cramped and decramped long before we actually approach Nyquist. What? Not sure I understand that comment. Peters, Narzik, fiddle music and stuff. Hey, what's up? Hi, I follow Lanthertronics, Token, Leandro, and IDDQD. <laughs> Thanks for all this super interesting content. Thank you for watching and for saying that. It's very nice of you. I like many content creators, authors, uh, music uh, producers and whatnot that I don't go out of my way to say thanks. So I appreciate you taking the time and effort to, to do that. It's uh, very nice of you. Um, which is not to say that's why my mixes sound poppy. Le Leandro's next stream, analyze every wave's play. <laughs> Even with non-cramped filters, I can do bad mi mixes. <laughs> Whoops, all this scrolling. Uh, apples to non-cramped filters. <laughs> Decramping isn't the end of the world. Even the channel strip in Pro Tools have a has a parametric filter that cramps, and goodness knows how many hit records has been done with that. Yeah. I'll say this again, we are nerding out strong here. We are not finding world peace. We are not, we are not curing cancer. We are looking at curves and being nerdy. That's what we are doing. Should make a plugging orange filters. However, if your EQ is a model of a hardware EQ that doesn't cramp, then yep, I think it's an implementation error. Maybe so. Nice work. Thank you. This performance meter give you a two decimal uh, give you two decimal places. Perhaps let's look. Let's look at that. Uh, it is under view. Performance meter. It was under view. And then I want to see the tracks 10 and 11 and you are right it gives me two not only it gives me two decimal points it also gives me the two numbers side by side which is much better thank you for that so yeah in this case we have more precision and looking at the numbers i think i see a difference i think that the the Decramped filters, which is track 11, is consistently a bit slower. It's not always, but it is consistently a bit slower. It is taking a bit more of my CPU. I don't, I don't think that this is a significant difference, first of all, but that's a judgment call. It depends on what you call significant. And um, there probably are more factors in... No, I think it is a, 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 a good assessment and it is consistent with what we expected because if you look at the equations used to compute the coefficients, let's look at these equations side by side. Here, this is a wash, sorry, this is a wash because it's the same in both sides, but here we are doing a bit more work, there we are doing a bit more work. This is very cheap. There is a bit of a cosine and a division here and there, but overall it's mostly multiplication, addition, and subtraction. And this is using many more of the uh, square roots, squares, exponentials, cosines, cosines hyperbolic that are actually hiding a couple of exponentials and a division. So 
just looking at the formulas, you can tell that this is doing more work. So you would expect some difference. Now the question is, is it a significant difference? For the most part, it seems to be in the decimal points. It seems to be, for the most part, on the second decimal point. Sometimes it goes above, sometimes it goes like now, but for the most part, it's on the second decimal point. Granted, I am on a relatively high-end machine. This is a Mac 1 Mini. This is a Mac 1 Mini. It's a Mac Mini M1 processor, the first that was released base model, 8 gigabytes, 8 gigabytes of RAM, the first M1 processor that was on a Mac Mini. So it's a relatively high-end machine. It is, however, under a bit of stress because I have all the streaming stuff running here as well. But anyway, these are the numbers we are getting. As far as I am concerned, the myth is busted, and we confirmed that the number of instances was right. Isn't that awesome? And now that we have this so neatly set up, how about we mute these tracks, unmute those ones, and see the performance difference on the Melda plugins on this performance meter. We are looking at tracks 3 and 4, 3 is cramped, 4 is decramped. Again, it is mostly on the second decimal, for the most part. I call this negligible. If I was developing a plugin, I would go decramped. I would go vConnect, probably. Anyway, Mika says, uh, thanks for the suggestion, Mage. Good call. Turning off the analyzer displaying Melda plugins seems to smooth out their performance. Maybe it's my imagination, maybe, but I think that if the display is just off completely like it is right now, then I think that these numbers are reflecting pretty much just the audio processing, because the UI is just not on the screen at all. So the uh, maybe the visualizer is too consuming some CPU, but it will be consuming the CPU in both, so it's a wash. Maybe it's consuming some CPU because it wants you to be able to open the plugin and right away have some feedback, so it needs to be accumulating samples on the background. There is a whole conversation to be had about that, but we had that conversation many times on these streams before, so I'll not repeat myself. Aaron says, when it comes to EQ, I feel like, mo uh, like people are overly obsessed with modeling hardware units. The whole analog modeling is a whole thing, right? There, there is a bit of obsession, there is a bit of status, there is a bit of nostalgia, marketing, politics, all of that is important when you are in the business of selling plugins, right? Joseph is here. Hey, I think if you add the original signal to a band pass filter signal, you get a bell EQ. Haha, <laughs> great point. You would think that. It depends on the filter and it depends on the, I guess, the Q and whatnot. In some cases, you are able to do that. In some cases, you are not. I don't remember exactly what I tested, but I remember seeing that happening. And there is, again, a Dan Warrow series of videos about EQs running in parallel, and he goes into all the useful things you can do with that even, because it's not just for implementers of plugins, you can also do that when mixing. You filter stuff in parallel and then you do stuff because of that. But you bring up a good point, so here's what I am going to do. I will put the vConnect plugin on a track. This is a bandpass. I will send white noise to it. This produces a bell. No, oh, I didn't send the audio, I sent the plugin. Second try. So now this is sending white noise to this track. It's producing a bell. Then what I want is to have a I think that this is what I want. I want to have a track in which I send both the bell as well as the original. So they're going to be summed up. And then I just look at the spectrum analyzer. I'm doing this with white noise. I could be doing with this with the Burton EQ analyzer. But anyway.
<laughs> for whatever reason, I cannot even read this very well. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the shape is moving, but this test is terrible. But what you can do is change the code in the plugin to add... Let's do that real quick. Uh, vconnect parallel. You can change the code in the plugin so that this equals becomes a plus equals. This way you are adding the original sample to the result of the filter. I'm filtering one side and I'm adding another side. I'm doing a mono mix here. Never mind that. Whatever. Let's try it. Uh, effects. So now I'm, I did three plugins. <laughs> doesn't always work. This technique doesn't always work. It works for some filters. Let's see if it works for this one. Um, what I need to do is vconnect parallel Burton. EQ curve analyzer. Hey, it seems to work this in this instance. Yep, this is how you do a bell. In this case, it worked. And if I change the Q, nicely behaved. But yeah, it doesn't always work. I'm not even sure that this is exactly right. Because if you look at it, let's put the curve at 10K. Is the bell at 10K? Well, it seems to be. So it seems to be holding up well. But there are some anomalies when you do this kind of parallel processing. It doesn't always work. Have to be wary of that. And sometimes what doesn't work is subtle. But in this case, it seems to hold up. So yeah. Now I did three plugins. Hey. Need to head out. Thanks for the great discussion. Thank you for being here. A big analog analog to digital T? I don't know what ADT is. Uh, automatic double tracking? Automatic double tracking console? Not sure what you mean, sorry. Uh, that's why I don't like acronyms. I tend to spell things out. Because I, I... For instance, I tend not to say RBJ. I tend to say, when I remember Robert Bristol Johnson, I tend not to say BLT. I tend to say by linear transform because of this. I'm not sure what, you say, what you're saying. Uh, consoles have no shelving filters, just five full parametric. You have to use them as shelves. Huh? By the way, they stream in tomorrow, Leandro. It's experimental, baby. Yeah, I will talk about that at the end. But yeah, tomorrow I will be a guest over at IDDQD Sound, Arya's channel. We will be doing some experimental stuff. It will be fun. Ben says, I missed some of the demo due to a phone call. We'll watch later. Thank you. However, now that you have a cramped and decramped filter, can you null them? Sorry if you already did that. I did not do that. You want me to null them. I will. I will. I will do that. I will do a null. So, in this case, I want RBJ. And in this one, I want VConnect. Not parallel, because I wanted a I want it to be a band pass. Which admittedly may not be the best test for a null, but that's what we have. So then K. Oops. Then K. And I ended up with a bunch of things here on this track. Try again. Then K. Oh no, it's copying the plugin. It's copying the plugin. I will Type 10, 1, 2, 3, 10k, 10k. I have RBJ on one track, I have VConnect on the other. They are both at 10. Uh, let's go let's go further up. Let's go 15. 15. I will do this test, but if you want to do other tests, I will invite you to use the project. Anyway, uh, I will flip the polarity on this guy. Oh no, just one, just one. That guy. And send my Noise. Boop. Shoot. Boop. And there you have it. It is not 
do I have something wrong in the setup? Let's go over this again. RBJ, 15K. Vconnect, 15K. Um, frequency spectrum analyzer. It's not nulling, but it's not nulling in much the same way, is it not? Isn't this interesting? You should also, when you're running, I'm not gonna, oops, sorry. I'm not gonna do this now, but you should do this when you get the project. You should null RBJ against your stuff. RBJ against Harrison 32C. According to Dan Waro, it will null, but I have not checked. Uh, RBJ against ReQ. Again, according to Dan Waro, it will null. I didn't check. RBJ against Mel the production, why not? To see if the analog, now that we even have a, a bell, you can see the bell against the Mel the production bell and you will see if those match or not. All of those things you can do later because it's already very late. I have been here for forever. <laughs> but we will do this null. So it is not nulling perfectly. So let me go into RBJ and try to compensate with the Q. Unable to. Doesn't get any better. And yeah, granted that this is at minus 60, so it's kind of okay. And this range is the range that people don't hear very well. So it's mostly fine, but, but it's not good. I would expect a much better null. Orange is a great name for an EQ. I might steal that for mine. Isn't that the name of a company that manufactures guitar amps? They're gonna come for you. <laughs> Regarding CPU use, the plugins math might be large swamped by all the other buffer passing and memory access than by the DAW. To test that, we would need, to, and that's a good point, for to test that, we would need to adapt our plugin to, instead of do one bell, it needs to do 64 bells in one plugin. So it needs to have a loop, it needs to have a bunch of filters instead of just one, and it needs to feed the output of a loop into the input of the next loop. I'm not gonna do that because I disagree with the, the, the premise. Whatever buffer passing is happening on both plugins, so we should be seeing a difference just on the filters. But I warrant that I may be wrong. So I invite you to do this transformation in the code. There are plenty of streams in which I do something like that, where I put loops to do things, and I even have a whole data structure thing that helps you out. In this case, I didn't use my whole library because I wanted things to be as simple, as, uh, as self-contained as possible. I wanted things to be as self-contained as possible. So I didn't use my library, but using my library, all of this gets much easier and it's definitely possible to do this. I think that that would answer this question that you have, but I'm not gonna do it right now. Hey Bo, don't get people confused with guitar amps. Ha, there you go. Perhaps the fireworks are still going off because Rishi Sun is the new prime minister. Not sure, I'm not following the news on that. Had to change to closed headphones. Good work, I learned some things, lol. <laughs> ADT is a brand, oh, okay. Also, who thinks of anything but bacon when you say BLT? <laughs> uh, yo, got a point there, John. You probably have to adjust the kill to get a no. I tried. But as, ma as you match the cramped side, you will unmatch the other side of the curve. And that's okay, because the other side of the curve is at the high frequencies that you care less about. Oh boy, that was a ride. We tested the correctness, the curve in Burton EQ. We tested the latency. We tested the performance and mo under modulation. Ah, man, we did everything. We checked every box on my list, everything that I had prepared. Awesome. Time to wrap up. This was a long stream, but thank you all for joining me. It was a lot of fun to have you here on the chat. Thank you to Aria, Bo, John, M9, Ben. Um, uh, Aaron, Joseph, Mika, May, Justin, John, I'm probably repeating <laughs> your names, Peter, and Chris, and uh, 
Dr. McFarland Studios. Nathan, thank you for joining me and for all the input. It has been very valuable to me. I'm probably missing some people. Uh, Juan, thank you to Pass Fund for trying to spam. Thank you to Aria for moderating. It was a lot of fun. So, coming up next, tomorrow I will be a guest over at IDGQD Sound. We will talk. We will do some experimental music. On Wednesday, we have the meeting of the C++ Digital Signal Processing Juice Study Group. So we will be talking about some C++. And then I will probably take the rest of the week off because I will probably do three long streams today, tomorrow, and on Wednesday. But next week, we will be back to coding and we may continue working on the auto mixer, but we may need to take a tangent because I received a bug report, a bug report on a web application, an open source web application that I maintain, kill the newsletter. And that's a, a deal breaker. I have to fix that. And as I am streaming all the time that I have to work on open source, I thought it would make sense for me to work on the web development stuff in the stream. We'll see. Keep tuned. Make sure you subscribe, ring the bell. Do whatever you want. You are the boss of you. Um, yeah, people are saying goodbyes. Had so much fun. I, uh, me too, me too. Yeah. All right. So with that, it's time to say goodbye. Thank you again, every much who was involved in the chat, watching this later. Thank you to Dan Warrow for the videos. Thank you to Harrison for not only doing the videos, but also for doing the plugin that in the end is teaching all of us so much in this conversation and otherwise. And thank you to uh, Dan from Lonely Rocker for the video there as well. Uh, thank you to Martin for designing the filters that I used and thank you for being such a nice person on email, on Skype and everything. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you to the authors of all the books, Robert Bristol Johnson as well, who designed the filters that we also use today. So yeah, thank you to all of you. You are great. I see you again tomorrow over at IDGQD. Have a good one. Thank you for watching the stream, you know how great it has been Or maybe it sucked and I am glad that you stuck with me And so we'll all will be Back together for some more coding or talking or chilling The next time I'll be streaming